Good morning. Welcome to NTD. I'm Matt Ganesda. And I'm Yi Yang. Welcome to the 2017 Falun Dafa Day live celebration in New York. Now, Falun Dafa, or more commonly called Falun Gong, is a Chinese Qigong practice. It has meditation and slow, gentle exercises that look a little bit like Tai Chi. And for today's event, we'll be following a massive Falun Gong parade as it flows across New York. Now today, Friday morning, is also a special day in that it marks the 25th anniversary of the founding of Falun Gong. So over the past quarter century, Falun Gong has been spread to more than 100 countries with an estimated 100 million Falun Gong practitioners worldwide. Falun Gong has also won more than 3,000 different awards from different countries and cities across the globe. But since 1999, the Chinese regime has been severely persecuting Falun Gong, arresting Falun Gong practitioners and sending them to labor camps. Why is the regime persecuting Falun Gong, and why do these practitioners defend their faith even in the face of death? And what are their stories? These are all questions we hope to answer in our coverage today. Now, joining us today in the studio, we've got a couple guests. Uh, the first one is Falun Dafa Information Center spokesperson, Arping Zhang. Arping, welcome to the show. Thank you. We also have with us Zenin Dolniki, a Falun Gong practitioner who's been involved in human rights uh, efforts over the past two decades. Zenin, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. All right, so Arping and Zenin are here to help us explain some of what we're seeing today and the implications both for China and for the uh, impact on the United States. So again, thank you both for joining us. That's right. We're ha happy to have you. And uh, over the next three hours, uh, our on-site reporters will share with us some stories, but first, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the parade. This year's theme is celebrating 25 years of Falun Dafa. The massive parade will have over 10,000 people from 57 countries from around the world. They will walk for more than three hours across New York City to spread the message of Falun Dafa to the people of New York and to the world. Now, uh, again, so this parade will be about three hours, and uh, we also have a couple on-site reporters who are going to share with us a number of compelling stories from the parade participants. So let me first briefly introduce our field reporters. This is Felicia Lee, uh, and we also have Ben Hedges with us. Uh, thank you both for joining us. Now, they're going to be in Manhattan uh, on 42nd Street near Bryant Park for most of the morning to talk to some of the folks as the parade goes by. And over the next three hours, our live coverage will be broadcast on our website, ntd.tv, as well as on Facebook Live and YouTube Live. And if you're watching us live, feel free to leave us a message on Facebook or YouTube should you have any comments, questions, or stories to share. And we'll be monitoring that throughout the three hours. Yeah, and we'll actually address your questions live on the show, so please do leave those. Now, Falun Gong uh, originated in China, so it would be accurate to say that this parade is, in fact, one of the largest traditional Chinese cultural events in the United States. Uh, and it, this happens every year on May 13th or close to May 13th. Uh, so now we're going to go to our reporter, Felicia Lee, who's going to take us through today's parade route. Hi, everyone. I'm in Times Square, New York City. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the area, Times Square is a commercial intersection, an entertainment hub, and a global focal point where people of all ethnicities, races, and cultures come to meet. So today, with the Falun Dafa Parade being crossing over this area, not only the people of New York will be able to witness the event, but the people of the world. So today's parade will start from the United Nations Plaza, going down 2nd Avenue until it reaches 42nd Street, which is the south outside of Times Square. So 42nd Street cuts through Midtown Manhattan and along the way we'll be seeing iconic landmarks such as the Chrysler Building, the New York Public Library, Bryant Park, Times Square and then heading further west we'll be bypassing one of the busiest and largest bus terminals, Port Authority Bus Terminal, where about 8,000 buses and 22,000 passengers pass through daily. Then the parade will continue onwards towards the Hudson Riverside. So as our hosts have said, today's parade will be passing through one of the busiest streets of New York City, and the NYPD has generously offered their help in escorting the parade from start to finish. It will be one of the greatest events, so you'll watch it all unfold right here. So are you ready? Let's go. All right. Thank you so much, Felicia. Now, for those of you who are just joining us, this is NTD's live coverage of the annual Falun Dafa Day Parade in New York City. That's right, and many of you have probably seen Falun Gong practitioners doing the exercises, meditating, or handing out flyers in different parts of the world. So what is Falun Gong? Let's watch a quick video about that. This is Falun Dafa, also known as Falun Gong. It's a spiritual practice based on a tradition that dates back more than a thousand years. It was once passed down only from teacher to disciple. 
In 1992, Mr. Li Hongzhi made Falun Gong public and began teaching it across China. Falun Gong is a type of Qigong, a class of gentle exercises and meditation designed to improve mind and body. Other Qigong systems, like Tai Chi, are also popular in China. But unlike most Qigong taught in China today, Falun Gong emphasizes spiritual improvement. Its core principles are truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance, or Zhen Shan Ren in Chinese. Falun Gong practitioners study its teachings through published texts, especially the book Zhuan Falun. They aim to elevate their moral standards while supplementing their practice with five sets of physical exercises. Nine-day Falun Gong workshops are offered in cities around the world. The workshops introduce the main text and teach the exercises. Falun Gong workshops are always free of charge. Since its introduction 25 years ago, Falun Gong has spread to tens of millions of people in 114 countries and regions. 2017 World Falun Dafa Day New York Parade. All right, uh, and now we're going to go back to our reporter, Felicia Lee, who's interviewing some of the Falun Gong practitioners from different countries who are involved in the parade. All right, guys, so here I am standing with all the people around the world who have worn their traditional attire. So let's go around and see where they're all from. Hello. <laughs> Hello, I'm from Slovakia. Slovakia. Germany. We Germany. Germany, too. Germany. Bavarian. Bavaria. Bavarian. Greece. Greece. Poland. Poland. Czech Republic. Czech Republic. Sweden. Sweden. All right, so that was the European portion. <laughs> and then we cross over to Japan. Japan. Nihongo. <laughs> Taiwan. Taiwan, yay. Indonesia. 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 Yeah. So many of you. <laughs> all right, so can we all say together, Falun Dafa is good. Awesome. Okay. So can you tell me a little bit about what you're wearing? Uh, what is this called? Uh, sorry. This is uh, from Jaffa. Jaffa. Japanese. Uh, uh, we Japanese. call it Japanese. Yeah. Okay. So also mine. This is Japanese. And when do you wear this? This is a national dress. I see. Yeah. So for special uh, ceremonies? Yeah, ceremonies. This is national dress. This is for... Uh, what you call for the merit. Ah, yeah. Very nice. All right. So let me come over here. Could you tell me a little bit about your costume? My costume is traditional national costume. Mm -hmm. It used to be worn by nobility and um, higher class society till after the World War II, before the communism took over Poland. I see. So when do you normally wear this dress? This is actually any official any official outfit. It, the difference is just the color it would be the, um, the level of the engagement. All right. Thank you so much. So we don't have time to explore all the attires today, but you can see generally what it's all about. So we're going to head back to the parade. All right. Thank you so much, Felicia. That was really great. Uh, now, for those of you who are just joining us, this is the 2017 Falun Dafa Day live celebration in New York, and we are broadcasting this live on NTD Television's Facebook page, our YouTube Live channel, as well as on our website, ntd.tv. Now, if you're watching on those platforms, especially Facebook and YouTube, please feel free to leave your comments below, uh, and we'll actually be answering those questions live during this broadcast. Now, there's going to be a parade, a march of, was it 10,000 people, I believe, are coming through New York this morning. Uh, and that's going to start in just a couple minutes. Um, now, we have a couple guests in the studio, as I mentioned. And, uh, you know, uh, R. Ping Jong and Zen and Dolniki, I want to ask you guys, uh, before the parade begins, could you just describe a little bit about what is Falun Gong? Uh, you want... Zen and go please, ahead. Please, go ahead. Well, Falun Gong uh, is also known as Falun Dafa. It's really a meditation exercise uh, based on the Buddhist tradition. And it has two components. One is five size of gentle, slow moving exercise. And the other co component will be uh, uh, the spiritual principles, uh, namely truthfulness, compassion, tolerance. And it's free exercise to public. Anyone can download the the teaching materials from the website, and you should go to a park and learn from each other. And uh, and since it's uh, introduced 
to the public in 1992, it has attracted over 100 million people around the world. Yeah, because you know, when I think yeah. of China, like you, know, you go to the parks in the morning and there's all these people doing these slow, gentle exercises. I mean, you know, a lot of our viewers have heard of Tai Chi. Uh, my understanding is there's, there's many different types of, of these Qigong practices, and Falun Gong is one of them. Yeah. Right? So. Yeah, um, but the, uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, you know, distinctive features about Falun Gong is its focus is on self cultivation based on these spiritual principles. Yeah, so what is, what is the self-cultivation? Self-cultivation is that you, uh, you, know, you practice these uh, principles in everyday life. It's not just uh, I do the exercise alone you know, in the park. You have to be a, strive to be a good person in accordance with this you know, truthfulness, compassion, tolerance. The other thing is Falun Gong actually includes you know, the, uh, the, you know, the elements of Taoism, for example. Uh, so this is a very like Eastern philosophy? Uh, not really. Uh, it, it is in a way because it, with the roots in Bo Buddha school, right? Right, and it is a Chinese yeah, practice. Yeah, right. But the, it has shared values you know, worldwide. We know that you know, uh, in each culture in the West or in the East, they all embrace the fundamental ten tenets of uh, human values such as truthfulness. Being honest, you know, compassion, you know, being kind, or tolerance of being for, you know, have the, you know, the element of forbearance. Right. So I think even, even the ancient Greek philosophers talked about this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, if you read, you know, Plato's books, we can find out that Socrates, you know, taught about, you know, the purpose of life is to return to original true self. In Greek word, they call the priori which means the you know, original true knowing side. That's interesting because priory in the sort of ancient Greek culture sounds a lot like the Taoist culture exactly, returning to the true exactly. self. Exactly. In the Taoist culture, Lao Tzu called for you know, return to original true self being the ultimate purpose of human life. So this all happened 400 BC. Obviously, they don't have internet connection, but they have shared values, though. Yeah. <laughs> so you're saying you know, Falun Gong is kind of, has some, some roots in this or some connection to this? Well, it is because the, the, the purpose of a cultivation is to reach enlightenment, to be a person of, uh, you know, wisdom. And if you know, you know, uh, most people know that, you know, the word philosophy in Greek means law of wisdom. So when one becomes enlightened to be wise, to have wisdom, you know, that, you know, one will be, uh, uh, you know, reaching a higher, you know, uh, plane of, you know, uh, the right mind. Huh. Yeah. Excellent. Interesting. Very All right. interesting. Yeah. And uh, so now the parade is just beginning. This is the uh, 2017 live Fallen Daffa Day celebration in New York. And the first group we're seeing right now is actually the Tianguo Marching Band. That's right. The Tianguo Marching Band is actually the largest Chinese majority marching band outside of China. And uh, you'll hear, hear more than a dozen kinds of instruments today. And uh, in a bit, we're going to take a listen to the music from this marching band. Well, this, is a, this is a big group, and this isn't even the whole marching band. I believe in the parade today, there's, what, 600 members of the Tianguo marching band, and this is just the first uh, 200 of them. That's correct, and they'll be separated. Those 600 band members will be separated into three different groups, and this is the first group that we're seeing now. All right, let's see if we can uh, hear a little bit of that music. You can definitely hear the drums in there. And for those of you just joining us, this is the 2017 Falun Dafa Day live celebration in New York. And this Tianguo marching band that we're seeing right now is uh, the first part of a three-hour-long march that's going from near the United Nations uh, building in New York all the way across Manhattan, you know, past Times Square, all the way to the Hudson River. Band members of the Tianguo Marching Band are actually from all over the world. They are from the United States, uh, both the East Coast and the West Coast, Europe, as well as Asia. And my understanding is these are uh, it's, these are not a full-time marching band participants. These are actually people that have got other jobs, uh, but they've been practicing for this for quite some time now uh, to get ready for this parade. This is a huge group. Look at that. There's 200 people just in this one section. 
That's correct. And what we're seeing now is uh, the flute group. And we'll take a listen right now. which in Chinese means uh, fallen off is good. And you can see they're marching down uh, 42nd Street uh, and 2nd Avenue in New York City. Many people might not know this, but actually most of the music that's played by the marching band is actually all original pieces written by Falun Gong practitioners. So that was, uh, we took a listen at the Tianguo Marching Band, and uh, we heard some of the original music written by Falun Gong practitioners. Looks like we're looking at the next section of the Falun Dafa Day Parade uh, in New York. That's right. Actually, before we get into that, I'd like to ask a question. Do you guys know what is the Chinese work that is translated into the most number of languages? You've probably heard of some different works of classical Chinese literature, books like the Tao Te Ching, which is about Taoism, as Arping mentioned. Uh, Journey to the West with the Monkey King, The Art of War by Sun Tzu, and, you know, there's a lot of these very well-recognized books, and a lot of them have been translated into, like, 20 different languages, uh, but none of them are the most translated book of Chinese literature. You're right, Matt. Actually, currently, the Chinese book that is translated into the most number of languages is actually Zhuan Falun by Mr. Li Hongzhi, and as of May this year, that book has been translated into 40 different languages. Now, in addition to the original language that it was published in, which is Chinese, the book now exists in 41 different languages. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at a video about that book, and then we're going to go to our on-site reporter, Felicia Lee, who's going to be talking to two of the book's volunteer translators. Zhuan Falun is the main text of the Chinese spiritual practice Falun Gong. Its nine chapters are based on Falun Gong founder Mr. Li Hongzhi's nine-day lecture seminars that were popular in China. The book is centered around Falun Gong's core principles of truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance. Zhuan Falun was first published in December 1994 by a Chinese state-run publishing house. In early 1996, Zhuan Falun was a bestseller in Beijing. Zhuang Falun was eventually banned in China after the Chinese Communist Party feared it had become more popular than party ideology. To meet public demand, the book was widely pirated and distributed by underground booksellers. From 2008 to 2009, thousands of Falun Gong practitioners from around the world gathered in Taiwan to form the cover of the Zhuang Falun to express their gratitude to Mr. Li Hongzhi for bringing Zhuang Falun to millions of people worldwide. Zhuang Falun has been translated into 40 languages, making it the most widely translated Chinese book of all time. Zhuang Falun is available for free online at falundafa.org. 2017 World Falun Dafa Day New York Parade. All right, welcome back to the 2017 Falun Dafa Day live celebration in New York. Uh, what we're watching right now is the uh, parade. About 10,000 Falun Gong practitioners are walking through Manhattan in New York City. And they're carrying banners. Now, these signs are the main principles of Falun Gong. We've got, uh, looks like the dragon 
Uh, this is a traditional Chinese dragon. It's got about uh, you know eight or a dozen people. And we can also see uh, some Falun Gong practitioners dressed in yellow, and they're actually demonstrating some of the Falun Gong exercises. And uh, and we see some of them holding banners that read Falun Dafa and Falun Dafa is good. Yeah, now, uh, Zen and Dolniki, we have you in the studio here, uh, and you've been practicing Falun Gong for a couple decades now. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what Falun Gong is? Sure. Um, my experience of, of learning Falun Gong is, is um, uh, although I have learned uh, the spiritual components of it, it's helped me spiritually, wh where I really gravitated to in the beginning were more the, just the straight health components. I come from a health and fitness background. I was studying health when I found Falun Gong, and it really just spoke to me explaining a lot of, of, of these traditional concepts that are associated with these ancient practices in this very colloquial language, even referencing modern day scientific discoveries and kind of demystifying these, these ancient concepts and making it very practical and accessible. And, and that's what I found in John Fulton was this very practical, easy to understand, very well explained um, That's really interesting teaching. you mentioned that. And so specifically, like, was there something that you had kind of been looking into and wondering, kind of like, you know, oh, how, how does this work? And it, you kind of understood that after reading Joan Fallon? Well, yeah, I had spent a lot of time on my health, so I, I felt very physically fit. I felt very healthy, but I wanted to go deeper into the human being, the human body, and understand these things. And studying ancient texts and, and older books, it was very hard to grasp. And right when I started reading uh, the Falun Gong teachings, uh, which are just transcribed from verbal lectures. It's very colloquial and very accessible. I just felt like a weight lift off my shoulders, and I felt like, oh, finally somebody's explaining this stuff. Yeah, I, I remember thought, when I was a teenager, I read the Tao Te Ching, which mm -hmm. is that you know twenty five hundred year old book. Yes. And like you know, the, I read it in translation in English, and I just I I could not understand. Like it was very like archaic terms, and I didn't really like you know how does that compare to? Uh, you mentioned earlier the book Juan Fallen, which is mm -hmm. the main text of Fallen Gone. Mm -hmm. Like how does that compare? Well, uh, I mean, 2,500 years ago, uh, uh, Lao Tzu couldn't reference modern-day scientific discoveries, archaeological <laughs> right, excavations, and things that have happened throughout the development of human civilization, particularly modern ones, which w ideologically we can identify a lot easier with to understand these deeper uh, things about cosmology or the relationship to our body, and how do we refine our body? How do we be in harmony with the universe? And you know, it's not this ancient abstract concept. When uh, Mr. Li Hongzhi is teaching it, it's this very practical one plus one equals two, and it makes so much sense. And it, for me, it was it was very easy to grasp. Yeah. Now you know, uh, Yi, you mentioned earlier that uh, Zhuang Falun, the main text of Falun Gong, has been translated into forty different languages. Now, Arping, uh, Arping Zhang, the Falun Dafa Information Center spokesperson, uh, maybe Arping, you could tell us a little bit about. You know why you think that this particular book has become so widely uh, widespread and widely popular in different countries and different languages. Well, like Zen mentioned, the uh, uh, the text of the Zhuang Falun is very simple and clear. And um, for those who have been searching for spiritual paths, and it, it feels you know just suddenly you know everything click right right there when you read it. Um, I remember the first time when I, uh, you know, uh, approached Falun Gong. I was uh, in 1994 while I was visiting uh, friends in Beijing. Uh, of course, at that time I lived in the United States already, and uh, I was in uh, a department of foreign ministry there uh, visiting a friend. I saw a lot of people doing meditation, like in, in the a, parks in, in Beijing. No, in the office. In oh, the foreign, office. Yeah, in the office <laughs> in the department of foreign ministry. Um, really? They were. They were all sitting, you know, closing their eyes, you know, meditating. So people like meditate before work in China? Yeah, they were during the work break. Okay. And then I asked, you know, the, the, uh, my friend who works there, yeah. I said, how come you guys get paid and sleep in the, in the office? <laughs> um, and they said, no, we are doing meditation. I said, what kind of meditation? They said, it's Falun Gong. I said, what is Falun Gong? And then she gave me a, 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 a booklet. It's called China Falun Gong. It's a very thin book. Uh, back then, uh, it covers you know the uh, instruction about the exercise and the core principles. So I said, yeah, maybe, he said maybe you should take you know take home and read about it because it's uh, the government is promoting this uh, for public health. 
Uh, in fact, the, uh, the, the Chinese foreign ministry in the embassies overseas, they are also promoting this as uh, part of the soft, soft culture, you know, soft power, you know, to uh, spread worldwide. And so I read the book. It, it really clicked with, you know, my original internal, you know, uh, search for uh, something that is traditionally Chinese, but also relevant to my current life. And, and she was right. The Chinese consulate general in New York held several seminars on Falun Dafa. And oh, that's even, right. So that was back in, in the early 90s. In the 90s, and uh, because it was part of the Chinese cultural propaganda scheme overseas. Interesting. And in fact, Mr. Li Hongzhi was invited. The first overseas trip was by the French uh, Chinese uh, uh, embassy in, in Paris. So just remind us who, who Mr. Li Hongzhi is. Yeah, Mr. Li Hongzhi is founder of the uh, Falun Dafa. He made the practice public in 1992. And when I uh, learned first, you know, Falun Gong, that was 1994, two years afterwards. And that was already, you know, when I was in China, in Beijing in 1994, you can see people in every major park in Beijing, if you, you know, the Temple Heaven Park, if you go to the Beihai Park, everywhere, you know, people doing it. It was like a, a household phenomenon. Uh, but little did I know that, you know, the, the government is, uh, you know, actively promoting this practice overseas. So the Chinese embassy in, uh, in, in France invited Mr. Li to give lecture there. And later on, the Chinese embassy in Sweden also invited him to you know, give a talk. And when Mr. Li was in New York, the Chinese consulate in New York you know, also organized actually a, 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 a seminar type of things inside the Chinese consulate. I was there. Wow, that's, that's uh, because, pretty remarkable because, compared to kind of what you see now. Yeah, because is, uh, at that time, you know, the, most of the people who are learning about Falun Gong in the United States are Chinese students. Yeah. Uh, now, and you people mentioned like the me. Chinese consulate, yeah. and I want to get back to the parade. Yeah. Um, For one. So there's a, there's a parade right now that's happening. For those of you just joining us, it's the 2017 Falun Dafa Day live celebration yeah. in New York. And they're actually walking on 42nd Street, which is going to go uh, from the United Nations building uh, the United Nations Plaza all the way to the Chinese Consulate, which is along the Hudson River uh, in New York. So we're looking at a, a different section uh, of the parade here, uh, people carrying banners about Falun Dafa, and Falun Dafa and Falun Gong are, are the same thing, uh, names, two different names for the same practice. And this is a traditional uh, Chinese Qigong and spiritual practice. Uh, so there's now 10,000 people uh, who are in this parade. It looks like the section of the parade is just getting by a marching by Grand Central Station uh, in New York City. That's right, and they're holding up banners that say Falun Dafa, that's the one on the bottom, and on top it says truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance. And those are the actually the main principles of Falun Gong. All right, it looks like they're sort of demonstrating some of the exercises uh, of Falun Gong there as well. Um, so we've got some uh, reporters in the field uh, who are gonna talk to some people about that, but before we do that, uh, I just wanna remind those of you uh, who are watching us uh, on Facebook Live or YouTube Live or our website that you can leave your comments below and we'll get to those. Uh, so now we're going to go to uh, our reporter in the field, Felicia Lee, and she's talking to a couple people who were involved in translating the main book of Falun Gong, Juan Falun, into different languages. Felicia? So I'm here now with Tomek Kowalski and Ileana Alessio, who both translated the Dram Falun book into their respective languages. Tomek, can you tell me what the process was like learning Chinese and translating it into Polish? Sure. So, you know, when I learned about Dafa, uh, you know, really quickly I realized that I, I should learn Chinese to be able to, you know, read master books in, in original. And so I got a dictionary and I started translating character by character, taking notes. You know, on the beginning it was not so easy, but, but with the time it was going faster and faster. In a, in a half a year, I finished the whole book. Wow, that's amazing, because I know languages are very hard to, you know, learn. So was it difficult for the Polish people to adopt and understand such an Eastern cultivation way that's presented? Well, when I started to cultivate 14 years ago, it, it was pretty, uh, people more, more, you know, narrow-minded. But now, you know, since, since some years, uh, things are changing. People are more open, they, they're looking for a different way of life, and, and you know, Falun Dafa 
<laughs> it's a great way of, 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 yeah. of life. And uh, so now actually lately we have a lot of people pouring in, starting practicing. Interesting. And what do you think was the most difficult part of translating? Oh, the more difficult, I guess there are those, you know, idioms. Like, uh, then I had to sometimes, you know, I had to learn a bit about history or, 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 or of some words, you know, yeah. uh, talk with Chinese people, like, you know, what it means. So, so the, 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 those idioms, when there's, you know, profound, deep historic history behind it. Yeah, that, 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 was the, that was the most difficult, but most interesting part. Thank you, Tomek. And Ileana, you had a similar experience translating into Spanish. So what was it like for you? Uh, well, it was very interesting too. Um, well, with my process, I was working with a native a Chinese speaker. I was publishing the, the translation. And what we found out is that the closer we went to the original Chinese, the easier to understand it was at least in Spanish. And so we found out that when we were stuck in a sentence, so we didn't know how to put it, we were go back to the Chinese, like word by word or character by character. And in that way, it became so simple and that it was the best approach. That we and how did you actually come about learning Mandarin? Was it difficult? Well, yeah, especially the tones, but this, in this case was just to reading um, the, the book. So it, but I have the help of the native speaker, of yeah. course. So. And so were there any difficult experiences or eye-opening experiences that, that you came across during that time? Yeah, well, as I said, sometimes when I thought that it would be hard to understand in Spanish and I tried to adapt it to Spanish, I found it that it was more complicated to understand. And when I went back to the simple uh, structure of the Chinese, it was really clear and better to understand. So grammatically, is Spanish and Mandarin similar or are they very different? They're quite different, but Spanish also is quite flexible. So you can kind of respect the Chinese structure of the sentence and it will still make sense in Spanish. So that's what we did. We did. Right. So Tomek, are you able to speak Mandarin conversationally now? Oh, I didn't really. Uh, well, well, well. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm not so, you know, the problem is, you know, I learned from the book. So uh, speaking, I'm still working on, a, you know, on speaking. Right. And are you able? All right. So that is all the time we have with Tomek and Ileana. You guys did a great job in the translating. I know it's really hard. So we're going to head back to the parade. Thanks, Felicia. That was wonderful. And uh, everyone who's just joining us, what you're seeing right now is NTD's special live coverage of the 2017 Falun Dafa uh, Parade. It is the 18th World Falun Dafa Day Parade, and this year's theme is 25 years of Falun Dafa. And what you're seeing on camera right now is actually Falun Gong practitioners who are holding banners, and they read various things. And, oh, there, we see a, a pretty float coming by with the... Uh, the giant lotus flower. On top, like. yes. Yeah, now, uh, for those of you who are watching us on Facebook Live and YouTube Live, uh, we're seeing a lot of people leaving comments. We also have greetings from uh, South Korea, Nigeria, Turkey, Poland, as well as from in the United States, Nevada, Florida, uh, Texas, Ohio, another Florida, a bunch of Floridas. <laughs> also, some greetings from India. Um, we have also have some questions, a number of questions about what is Falun Dafa, also called Falun Gong. So, uh, briefly... Uh, Zen and Dolniki, you've been practicing Falun Gong for a couple of decades. Could you describe in a couple sentences what Falun Gong is? Sure. Uh, from my experience, Falun Dafa is a, um, a health, a health uh, practice which goes uh, a little deeper into a, a deeper spiritual practice. Um, uh, spirituality in Asia can be associated with religion and it doesn't have to be. And Falun Gong is, is very much a, a, a healthy living practice and it has five sets of exercises, it has meditation, and the reason it spread so, uh, so fast in China was the profound health benefits people were experiencing. Yeah, now it's interesting you mentioned the health benefits uh -huh. uh, because you know, in China uh, a lot of people you know, do these different types of Qigong. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you've heard of Tai Chi probably, people doing slow exercises, and Falun Gong was known to be very healthy. Uh, so in, in the early 90s, Falun Gong became public and started spreading all across China. You'd go to different parks and see people practicing. Uh, and this phenomena of, of Falun Gong and other types of Qigong were accepted to a degree by the government, but especially they were being researched actually by the Chinese Academy of Sciences and other scientific organizations. Uh, they were trying to use scientific methods in China to explore some of these inexplicable phenomena in Qigong, things like uh, Qigong healing as well as even supernatural capabilities. Actually, there was a man who was named Qian Xue Sen, and he was once China's leading nuclear physicist, and he actually said that the supernatural capabilities of the human body are extraordinary. 
he made that statement in uh, 1982, and that was at a meeting of the Chinese Human Body Science Association. And this is what he said, quote, Qigong and supernatural capabilities are parts of human sciences worthy of deeper research. They could lead to a bigger scientific revolution than the 20th century's quantum mechanics and the theory of relativity, unquote. Again, this is China's leading nuclear physicist saying that, not just some guy. Uh, he also told the guy who was the deputy, the deputy minister of propaganda that, and this, this is his quote, supernormal, uh, human supernatural capabilities are real, not fake. There are fabricated cases and cases intended to deceive people, but those are not human supernatural capabilities. Human supernatural capabilities, Qigong, and the theories of traditional Chinese medicine are closely linked, unquote. But because the Chinese Communist Party promoted atheism, research about human supernatural capabilities unnerved the regime. However, under the growing popularity of uh, Qigong, Qigong had room to flourish. And in 1992, Mr. Li Hongzhi, as we mentioned earlier, started publicly teaching Falun Gong. And uh, he received many awards when he took his students to the uh, Beijing Asian Health Expo. Yeah. Now, uh, so speaking of, of some of these health benefits, we've actually got a, a reporter on site who's going to be talking to a doctor and a patient uh, just about this issue. So we've got Ben Hedges, uh, who's at the parade. Let's go to Ben. World Falun Dafa Day. Well, hi everyone. I'm here at the side of the parade. The, as you can see behind me, the Tianguo Marching Band, which is a band made up of Falun Dafa practitioners, uh, is just going past. And I'm here with Christine Lin and Joshua Lee. Welcome, guys. Um, so, first of all, Christine, I know that you have quite a story. You suffered from an uncurable skin condition uh, before you practiced Falun Gong, and you actually recovered. Would you like to tell us about that? Sure. Um, I was suffering from a lot of health issues, actually, from when I was very young. I had pneumonia twice as a kid, about when I was three or four years old. And then I had, uh, starting when I was about five or six, I had this skin condition, like you said. It was symmetrical around my body, on my face. Everywhere was oozing, bleeding, itching. It was just horrible. And it lasted for two, almost three years. And that was until I found Falun Gong. Before that, we were trying all sorts of cures, like we went to the allergists, we went um, to the Western doctors, the Chinese doctors. I drank all the weird herbal medicines that you can dream of, like alligator skin and, and bitter herbs and things like that. Nothing worked until we found Falun Gong. And when I started uh, doing the exercises and reading the book and really doing the mind-body practice, things started changing really fast for me. Yeah, and the skin condition, it came out really quick. All the symptoms came out and came out hard and after that within two months it was all gone and I just the normal skin was revealed. Well that's amazing and I'm so pleased for you that you got over uh, that condition. Now um, Joshua you're a doctor you're in fact a spine surgery fellow at Columbia University what do you make of uh, Christine's recovery? Yeah most of the skin disease is caused by the immune dysfunction and one of the paper maybe can explain it uh, this paper is published in the Journal of the Alternative the Complement uh, Medicine. They investigate the uh, isolate uh, neutrophil cells from the Falun Gong practitioners and put in the culture. And they found Falun Gong practitioners, the uh, neutrophil can survive much longer than the control group. They also did the gene analysis. They found the gene regulating the immune system has increased. So uh, it's, Falun Gong is not good for the immune system, but also for the chronic disease. Like my father, he used to have the back pain, leg pain, radiculopsy, and doing a lot of treatment, but did not help. And he practiced Falun Gong for 20 years. The back pain has not come back yet. So from a spine surgeon point, it is amazing. 
Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us, and uh, thank you, Christine, for sharing your story with us. Uh, we can just see another part of the parade is going past. Uh, uh, practitioners of Fandafa are carrying uh, Dram Falun, the uh, main book of the teachings of Falun Dafa uh, going beh uh, behind us. Um, the book has been translated into several dozen languages and you can see they're carrying the covers in many different languages. I think we have Thai, obviously Chinese, English and uh, several different European languages. Uh, there are almost 10,000 people here uh, from all over the world uh, joining this parade. And so, well, you guys are going to be joining the parade in just a moment, right, after this interview. Okay. Well, I'm going to let you get on with that. Um, of course, thank you so much for coming. And, uh, yeah. And, oh, we got a dragon coming. <laughs> cool. Thanks, guys. It's great to see you. Okay. We'll go back to some images of the parade. <laughs> All right, thanks, Ben. Nice. Watch out for that dragon. <laughs> that was that was something special. And for those of you just joining us, this is NTD's special live broadcast of the 18th World Fallen Dafa Day Parade. And this year's theme is celebrating 25 years of Fallen Dafa. Now, for those of you just joining us, uh, we're broadcasting live on Facebook Live, YouTube Live, and, of course, our website, ntd.tv. This is NTD Television's special broadcast. Uh, for those of you watching, you can actually leave your comments and questions below. Uh, and we've already had some people do that, and we'll try our best to uh, address those here, uh, both me and Yi, as well as our two guests in the studio. We have with us uh, R. Ping Zhang, who's the Falun Dafa Information Center spokesperson, as well as Zenin Dolniki, uh, a longtime Falun Dafa practitioner who's also been involved in some of the human rights work with Falun Gong. Um, so now what we're looking at, again, is this uh, parade. It involves about 10,000 people uh, who are walking through New York City right now this morning. Uh, going from the United Nations Plaza all the way across Manhattan along 42nd Street, past Grand Central Station, past Times Square, past Port Authority, all the way past the Chinese Consulate, then to the Hudson River on 12th Avenue. And I think what we're seeing right now is the drum team. Hearing some of those drums and uh, some people dressed in ethnic costumes. Yeah, no, there's a uh, Falun Dafa practitioners are uh, from many different countries around the world. You mentioned earlier, Yi, that. Uh, people have flown in from, what, 50-something different 57 countries? 57 countries, actually. Wow. Actually, people from more than 100 countries and regions around the world have fallen down for practitioners, but here in New York, we have 57 countries. Yeah. Now, I, I want to talk about something that we talked about a little earlier. Um, the interview that uh, reporter Ben Hedges just did was with a, a doctor, a spine surgeon, talked about some of the, the healing benefits of Falun Gong and Arping. Uh, now, you're the Falun Dafa Information Center spokesperson. I wanted to ask you a bit about this. Um, when Falun Gong first came to the public, you know, was it seen as more of a healing thing or more of a spiritual thing? Or, you know, how did people perceive that back in 92 when it first became public? Well, actually, people of different kinds, you know, from different walks of life approached Falun Gong. And some, you know, came for the health, you know, benefits. Some were looking for spirituality. Um, China is actually traditionally um, uh, a very uh, spiritual country. We often call China Shenzhou, which means divine, land of divine, which means you know, the, the people has been always uh, relate to one way or the other, the Taoist school or the Buddha school, all you know, the Confucian thinking. So, but since 1949, uh, when the Communist Party took over the country, uh, because of the atheist nature of the party, uh, all these traditional values have been, uh, you know, suspended, and we have the Cultural Revolution. Everybody have heard about it, which essentially well, what, what happened during the Cultural Revolution with respect to, you know, yeah, religion and spirituality? Yeah, they, they basically denounce all the traditional values and burn the Buddhist temples and the Taoist, you know, temples and the scriptures. So by cultural revolution, they actually mean getting rid of all the culture. Exactly. And there's a reason for it from the communist perspective. After all, the communist ideology has come from Germany, uh, created by the guy called Karl Marx. And so it's a foreign import. It has no roots in Chinese you know, culture. So in order to have a successful transplant of this foreign import in China, they have to root out the traditional values. 
So from the, 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 uh, the dictatorship perspective, it makes sense. So you're saying that the sort of ideas of, of Marxism just didn't match with the Chinese traditional thinking? No, because Karl Marx has a very famous uh, you know, uh, statement. Religion is the opium of the mass. Right, I think I've and, heard that. Uh, you know, we know that you know the all the Chinese tradition, either from Buddhist school or from the Taoist school, is always you know entrenched, you know, deeply rooted with the divine spirit. So when when they try to root it all this out, they cannot then have you know easier uh, transplant of this foreign import. So then, the Cultural Revolution lasted uh, about ten years, right, from 1966 to 76, to 76. After, you know, until Mao Zedong died. Yes. Uh, and then sort of after that, what was it like for spirituality and religion in China? Well, there has been a, always spiritual void, you know. Uh, at the beginning, the, the word qigong is a new uh, modern term for meditation or spiritual practice. Right, now qigong refers to sort of the general class of practices that includes Falun Gong, includes Tai Chi, includes all these other sort of slow, gentle exercises you see well, in the parks, right? Yeah, well, the, what happens, the practitioner in order to avoid conflict with the government, they coined this word qigong, you know, otherwise you will be practicing Buddhist meditation, uh, Taoist meditation, oh, okay. or, you know, uh, you know, uh, so it's you the know, same thing, but they put on a, a name that, that seemed to sort of neutral. comply, like neutral, like politically yeah. neutral yeah, or politically spiritually neutral, neutral yeah. like, Safe. or not yeah. spiritual, rather. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's, that's how, you know, the, the term Qigong, because in the Asian Chinese uh, books, there's no such word called Qigong. It's a modern term, you know, founded uh, since the uh, communist <laughs> Right. Took over the and there's a bunch of these types of qigong that have names like Falun Gong, Zhong Gong, like yeah. different types of, of yeah, names, right? Yeah, but the, the real term is actually Falun Dao Fa, you know, uh, the, the, which is uh, the, the, the wheel of, you know, the Dharma wheel, you know. When, when you talk about the, the right. sort of the original name, I mean, F Falun Gong actually was introduced to the public 20, uh, 25 years ago yes. in 1992, yeah. but it also has a, an older history than that, am yeah. I right? Well, traditionally, all the uh, majority of the Buddhist or Taoist meditation exercises are passed down to single disciples, generations after generations. So Those, it's kind of like this like master teaches a disciple, and the exactly, disciple becomes the exactly. new master, kind of yeah, like that? Yeah, there's a saying that uh, in, Bud in Buddha school alone, there were 86,000 schools, branches. 86,000 different yes. types, in, oh, wow. Within the Buddha school alone. And within the, uh, the Taoist school alone, there are 36,000 branches or, you know, um, you know, denominations. Right, because I've only heard about maybe like a dozen of them. Yeah, like, because right? those were made public historically. Majority of them have been te taught, you know, from uh, the master to single disciple, generation after generation. And so these sort of practices passed down from a single master or single yeah. teacher to disciple, are they still, are they still around today? Because well, I haven't really heard of them. Well, there are a few, in, because they don't come to public, and they just been traditionally, you know, inheriting this tradition to pass down, you know, the, uh, the in, you know, imparting the teaching to one disciple. Uh, and, uh, and a Falun Gong is one of the sort of uh, rare practices that has been made public. Exactly, in uh, 1992, right. yes. And for those of you just joining us, uh, we're doing a live coverage of the Falun Dafa Day celebration in New York. We've got 10,000 people who are practicing Falun Gong, which, as you mentioned, is a traditional uh, Chinese meditation and spiritual practice. Uh, and they're walking through Manhattan all the way across uh, from the East River all the way to the Hudson River on the west side. Uh, and there's 10,000 people from 57 different countries uh, being represented, talking about uh, Falun Gong in different languages, wearing different costumes, uh, representing... Uh, you know, their traditional nation's costumes. Um, and so, you know, we've got a bunch of folks from different countries. Uh, and again, so for those of you just joining us who are watching us on Facebook Live or uh, our YouTube live channel, you can leave your comments uh, below that video. And we have someone monitoring those comments, and they'll be passing them to us, and we can read those and answer any uh, questions that you have. That's right. And if you look on the uh, screen right now, we'll see Falun Gong practitioners from different parts of the world, and they're passing by Grand Central uh, Terminal right now. All right. Uh, and, you know, we were talking earlier a bit about some of the, uh, the health effects of people who practice Falun Gong. Uh, and there's actually, there was an observational study published last year in the American Society of Clinical Oncology that suggested that 
cancer patients who practice Falun Gong have a significantly longer life expectancy and may often see cancer remission. Now you might be wondering you know, how this is even possible. Well, we're going to take a quick look at that study and then go to our on-site reporter, Ben Hedges, who will be interviewing that study's author. Dr. Yu Hongdong conducted research on how practicing Falun Gong has led to great improvement in advanced cancer patients. Dr. Dong is a clinical researcher at Novartis, a global healthcare company. Her research looked at reports from Chinese cancer patients who had started practicing Falun Gong. The 152 terminal stage cancer patients had been given short life expectancies with an average of 5.1 months. After the patients started practicing Falun Gong, they lived for an average of 56 months, 10 times the original average life expectancy. As of the time her research was published, 149 of the 152 patients were still alive. Dr. Dong says that although Falun Gong is not practiced for the purpose of curing cancer, her studies suggest that cancer patients who practice Falun Gong have a longer life expectancy and tend to see greater improvement in their conditions. Falun Gong's effect is repeatable, objective, substantial, and should deserve more attention. A summary of Dr. Dong's study was published as part of the American Society of Clinical Oncology's annual meeting in 2016. 2017 World Falun Dafa Day New York Parade. Well, I'm here with Dr. Dong Yu Hong and also Professor Wu, who is a professor of organic chemistry. Thanks so much for being with us here today, guys. So, um, Dr. Dong, I would first like to ask you, so ASCO published a report about uh, cancer survivors who practice Falun Gong. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, we have observed 152 terminal cancer patients who were diagnosed uh, in hospital with a predicted survival no more than six months. Uh, most of them were dying at home. One third of them were preparing for funerals. After practicing Falun Gong, their actual survival was significantly prolonged, uh, uh, at least ninefold than prediction. And until the cutoff date of report, 149 were still alive. In addition, 97% of the cases had a complete symptom recovery. So, um, we later, we prospectively observed one patient with prostate cancer and who is standing beside me. Yeah. Well, so you've actually yeah, brought one of your patients with us here today, uh, Professor Wu. Uh, it's great that you can be with us here today, and I understand you had uh, prostate cancer and you survived and you practiced Falun Gong. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your story? Okay. Uh, I was an end-stage uh, prostate cancer patient with bone metastasis. Uh, my PSA was 468, and I had bone pain and hormone treatment for 19 months, um, it, the uh, cancer came back. And uh, that's when I started to practice Falun Gong. Uh, one, about one month after that, my PSA went down greatly. And uh, eight months after that, uh, the um, bone metastasis seemed to disappear according to bone scan. And now I've been off cancer medicine for over 10 months now. And I'm a healthy person with no bone pain, normal PSA, and uh, the, the bone scan, as I said, uh, showed disappearance of my metastasis. And uh, my, uh, I have a very optimistic outlook for my future. And you're still practicing Falun Gong? Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, so, uh, to, let me just ask Dr. Zhang, what do you make of uh, Professor Wu's recovery? Oh, it's all due to his practice in Falun Gong. So, uh, all because he has read the, the Zhang Falun and the practice the exercises. And I'm a doctor working in hospital and I have been uh, a clinical research scientist in big pharma for many years. And I use a very strict method to analyze all these cases. 
And uh, after um, I got the result, I'm convinced and I'm shocked. The healing power of Falun Gong is really amazing. So uh, this phenomenon definitely deserves more attention. The mechanism is also worth well thinking about. Uh, many of our cases, they had experienced the significant spiritual mental improvement before their symptom improvement. So, um, you know, our human eyes can see very limited things. And the material world contains a lot of things that we couldn't see, but, but they still exist. For example, spiritual and the moral aspect. Well, well, thank you so much, guys, for being with us here today. And I, I wish you good luck in your recovery. And thank you. OK, back to the parade. Thank you, Ben. And for those of you who are just joining us, this is NTD's special live broadcast of the 18th World Falun Dafa Day Parade. And this year's theme is celebrating 25 years of Falun Dafa. Falun Dafa, more commonly called uh, Falun Gong, is a Chinese Qigong practice. Now, now, for those of you who are watching on Facebook and YouTube, as we mentioned earlier, uh, you can leave your comments below. And we've got a couple questions, actually, from our viewers. And the first one is from Noble Michelle, who asks, uh, where can I take Falun Dafa classes? Um, so the answer to that is uh, online uh, Falun Dafa, also called Falun Gong, has an online website, which is www.falundafa.org. Or you could just Google Falun Dafa, and you'll find that website. And they've got a, a bunch of different languages, and you can find a, uh, a local contact person in your city. And uh, uh, as you mentioned, Arping, I believe all those classes yeah. are always taught for yeah. free, am yeah. I right? Yes. So you can find a free uh, Falun Dafa class uh, in any major city, I believe, um, at least outside of uh, mainland China. The next question comes from Richard Gianfredi, who asks, uh, what is special about Falun Dafa Day? Is it like Christmas, July 4th, uh, or the original founding, or what? Uh, Arping, could you answer that question? Yes, this is the 18th anniversary of Falun Dafa Day. What happens since the persecution uh, 18 years ago, and there, the people, practitioners around the world, feel there's a need for the world to recognize, you know, what Falun Dafa has done for people outside of the United States. Uh, right. outside in the, of the specific date yeah. of the we Falun We found Dafa May, May 13th. Right. Yeah, May 13th is a designate as the World Falun Dafa Day. Right. So technically that's tomorrow, but the parade is today. Yes, this. but, right. you know, uh, uh, for seven years, let me say this, you know, the New York uh, State Senate has passed you know, uh, uh, proclamations just for the World Falun Dafa Day. Oh, so it's which actually is very actually, widely recognized, Falun yeah, Dafa Day. Yeah, yes, from May 12th to 14th, because they want to give you a grace period of few so days. It's like a Falun Dafa weekend, right? Yes, exactly, <laughs> okay. exactly. But the day is already May the 13th. And, and the, the original, so, so Falun Gong has been in public now for 25 years, and it was introduced, actually, uh, on May 13th, 1992. Exactly, right? so that's that was why. the reason they picked yeah, the date. Yeah, that's okay. the reason, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, and for those of you just joining us, again, we were addressing uh, some of the viewer comments, and you can leave your comments below on Facebook Live uh, or on YouTube Live, of course, on our website, ntd.tv. And this is our special NTD television coverage of the 2017 Falun Dafa Day live celebration in New York. Uh, and we're watching a parade of 10,000 people from all over the world uh, walking through New York to celebrate this Falun Dafa Day, which happens every year on or roughly on uh, May 13th. Now, uh, we want to talk about an issue because Falun Gong, uh, as you mentioned, was introduced in 1992, and it became very popular in the 90s. And, and Arping, you mentioned, uh, now you were living in the United States in the 90s, but you went uh, back to China in 1994, you said. Uh, in, in China in the 90s, it was kind of, you know, transitioning from that communist-style economy to the somewhat more capitalist economy we see today. Uh, I remember in the 90s, people were riding bicycles everywhere uh, when I was in China. Uh, you know, but what was, what was it kind of like um, for people who wanted to do Falun Gong or different spiritual practices in the 90s? In the 90s, uh, you could do the meditation exercise under the, uh, the coin term Qigong. You know, you cannot mention it's a, it's a Buddhist spiritual practice because the religion 
in China are spon they have sponsored state so called state sponsored religion organizations. Was well, it state sponsored religion? So like let's say you're a Christian in China. Yeah. Yeah. How does that work if it's state sponsored? Because your highest authority as a Christian is to, you know, you know, God or Jesus. Yeah. Right? But in China, so, so how does in that work? China they call it the patriotic Catholic Association or patriotic, you know, uh, uh, Buddhist association means that you have to pledge your loyalty to the party and the state first before you pledge loyalty to God. Wait, so in other words, what you're saying is that if you, if you want to be Christian in China, your loyalty to God and Jesus is below your loyalty to the Communist Party. Definitely, because you, 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 let's use Catholic Church for example. Okay. The priest is not appointed by the Holy See in Vatican, right? That's it's right. They don't recognize the Pope. Exactly. Yeah. So the, the Communist Party handpick who is going to be the priest and so well why does the communist party even care about this well because of the control in you know political scientists know that all the di dictatorship society have three things in common the first thing is ruled by terror they can you know threaten to persecute or kill you anytime the other is control of information and the control of mind and the third thing is they will offer alternative you know, ideology other than your traditional belief, which is communist ideology. So if they meet its three criteria, then they can successfully, successfully rule you know, the state for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Now, now uh, the next thing I want to do, because we're watching this live uh, Falun Dafa celebration in New York, and we talked a little bit earlier about the connection between Falun Dafa and health. And we have a reporter, Ben Hedges, who's on the scene, and he's actually talking to a, a neuropsychologist uh, a, bit, a bit about some of that connection between mind and body uh, that we see in Falun Gong. So uh, let's go to Ben now after this short video. World Falun Dafa Day New York Parade. Hi everyone, so I'm here with Marie Helen from Quebec City in Canada. Uh, so thanks very much for being with us uh, today, Marie. Now you're a psychologist and a neuropsychologist. Uh, first of all, I'm going to ask you, how did you start practicing Falun Gong? I started uh, in 2012. Uh, my aunt introduced me and I, I start enjoyed the practice right away. Okay. I really liked it. And yeah, so what, what effect did it have on your body and mind? Uh, when I, as soon as I started, I became calmer, set more self-confidence. Uh, my mind would start to think uh, slower, nicer. Uh, my behavior changed. I became to be nicer with my people, with people around me. It changed my whole life. Well, I know you're a neuropsychologist, so I want to ask you a question from that kind of point of view. What um, do the neurosciences understand about the effect of meditation practices like Falun Gong uh, on the brain? Actually, Falun Gong hasn't, has not been yet studied in the medical field, but what we study is mindfulness. It's meditation mindfulness, which means that uh, meditation in full consciousness here and now. And the impact we know it has, it has, first of all, on concentration. It helps in ADHD, attention deficit disorder, with children and adults. It helps in depression to help mind and emotion in people who suffer from depression. It also helps in, in general anxiety. And, and how does it do that? What does it actually do inside the brain? Oh, this is so interesting. What we find in the last five or ten years, we see that there's major region in the brain that has new neuronal connection. That means that mindfulness, meditation and mindfulness are, does change your body. It does change the connection it has on your brain, especially in the frontal, prefrontal lobe, which is the area right here of your brain. There's new connection doing there. That's the site of thinking, of higher thinking. And also, and deeper in the brain, uh, in the amygdala, it also changed that structure. In the amygdala, is responsible for emotion. 
we know more than that and still study going on. Well, thank you so much for sharing with that with us. I wish I could hear more about that. It really is interesting. Thank you for coming down today. Back to more shots of the parade. The mind. All right, thank you so much, Ben. That was really interesting about the connection between the, uh, you know, the mind and the body and what uh, she said about the frontal lobe. Now, what we're looking at right now, live uh, in New York, uh, is a Fallen Dafa celebration. Uh, the 25th anniversary of Fallen Dafa being brought to the public. And we've got a lot of folks uh, from 57 different countries. And in fact, there's 10,000 uh, Fallen Dafa practitioners in New York. Uh, now, Fallen Dafa and Fallen Gong are the same thing. Um, we see uh, people from Indonesia. We saw some folks from the UK earlier and from Israel uh, all over the world coming here to New York uh, right now this Friday morning, May 12th. That's correct. And here they are holding some banners, and they just represent each of the regions that they come from. And uh, earlier we even saw some people uh, dressed up as uh, cowboys, and I was told that they are from Utah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Now, uh, back in the studio, we've got with us Zenin Dolnicki, who's been practicing Falun Gong for about two decades. Uh, he's actually from Canada. Uh, Zenin, could you talk uh, briefly about your experience learning about Falun Gong in the, in the 90s? Sure, sure, yeah. I actually came across Falun Gong while I was actually mentoring to become a, an acupuncturist. So I was mentoring under a Chinese medicine doctor, and I was even in treatment sessions, and I was applying, applying those needles. And uh, when I found Falun Gong, one of the things that struck me right away, because I was learning about this, uh, this science of energy passageways that run through the body, is that in the very first exercise of Falun Gong, which has a very traditional name, Buddha showing the thousand hands, has a very simple, concrete, scientific benefit, which is opening all the energy passageways in the body. Meanwhile, so, so, I'm so you're spending... talking about the connection between sort of acupuncture and traditional Chinese medicine and Falun Gong that kind of works along the same energy channels? And that's, that's, that's like I, I keep saying, it's a simple, practical way of explaining these things that just spoke to me and really helped guide me into a, a very, very healthy lifestyle, um, a very streamlined, uh, very high level, uh, and beautiful. And it's really helped inform me and pro provide a much better service to my own clients as a health and fitness professional. And I, now, you mentioned about you know, Falun Gong and sort of the, 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 he the relationship to healing. Mm -hmm. And I understand now, Arping, uh, the Falun you're the Falun Dafa spokesperson. Uh, in the early 90s, I understand that uh, Falun Gong was kind of, there was a reputation for uh, Falun Gong actually healing a lot of illness. Uh, and that came from, I believe there were some uh, you know, illness treatment things that, that people had heard of, or people were coming to the practice to get their illnesses cured. How did that work? Well, what happens is when the practice was first introduced to the public, it was began by word of mouth. You know, people benefit and then pass it to you know, friends and family members. And later on, when the government found out, you know, this is really working. So in Beijing, there's a very famous hospital. It's called Concord, Xiehe Yuan, Concord Hospital. It was actually set up by, by the French, you know, in the, uh, in the 1900s. And the hospital did a survey on the uh, pract about 10,000 Falun practitioners in Purple Bamboo Park in Beijing. They follow up these practitioners for one year. And then they do, you know, scientific research, medical research on these people, on chronic illness, on different kind of type of disease. And then after the one year study, they released the report. They found out it's very good. In China, we have a Chinese sports commission. It's like a ministry of sports. And they are in charge of so-called public health campaigns. So the leader, the commissioner of this China sports commission went to Changchun, the founder's hometown. And he personally investigated the benefits of the Falun, the Falun Gong and Falun Dafa. And when he found out it's, you know, the medical report is very good. So he decided to promote it as a public sport, you know, health campaign. So what you're saying so, is, is in the 90s, the Chinese government was actually promoting Falun Gong for its health benefits. Exactly. And then this is why the government showered this practice with so many proclamations and honors, certificates, awards, you know, all those things. And they were trying to promote it overseas as part of the Chinese, you know, culture, uh, you know, heritage. I see. Now, China, yeah. you know, didn't really have much of a healthcare system at that time. Well, they had, but it was minimum because of the, uh, the, the lack of facilities, and uh, we have a huge population, and there's, uh, you know, not enough, you know, medical, trained medical staff. So the public health campaign is in the interest of uh, 
the government. Just read the, the February issue of 1990, 90, uh, let me see, 1999, in February, the US News and World Report published an article interviewing the commissioner of China's sports commission, who said, you know, the Chinese premier, Zhu, Zhu Rongji at that time, was very happy about this practice because it saved the government a lot of money because of the health benefits. So this article, you know, is, is online, you can read it, you know, very clearly shows that the government officials were endorsing the practice because of health. That's fascinating, and that's a, a strong contrast with what we see today in China. And we haven't talked much about this, but uh, in China today, it's actually banned. You're not allowed to practice Falun Gong, or you could get arrested for it. But of course, it is practiced in you know, more than 100 countries around the world. Uh, and what we're looking at now is actually, uh, we're covering uh, live coverage of the Falun Dafa Day Parade in New York City. Uh, and we've got people from 57 different countries, about 10,000 people in total from around the world who've flown in. Uh, to celebrate Falun Dafa Day, which falls every year uh, on or near May 13th. Um, now we've got uh, we've got some more uh, questions from uh, our viewers. One of our viewers uh, named Richard Gianfredi, he's asking, uh, is there an adaptive Falun Gong for people with physical handicaps? That's a great question, uh, and uh, maybe one of you wants to uh, to answer that question. I'll, I'll, I'll take a step at that. And uh, also, the people who somebody had asked about learning Falun Gong and they could go to falundafa.org and look at the, at the, website. Con yeah, the yeah. contacts uh, around the world in various cities. And I think it's important to emphasize the fact that it's free, but also to help you know, prepare people for what they're going to expect. It's going to be in a park. It's going to be somewhere where it doesn't cost anything because Falun Gong doesn't accept or circulate any money. So prepare yourself for the elements. Uh, but uh, so know. they never charge any money. No, no, absolutely zero, zero money. And, yeah. and to answer uh, his specific question, yep. uh, how does it work if someone has a physical handicap? Yeah, that's, can that's they a still great practice? question. Absolutely, they can practice uh, with whatever part of their body they can do it. The energy that's being uh, circulated and moved through the body um, is, uh, you could argue, very, very microscopic or in in another dimension. So they're they're still going to be getting a lot of the benefits. There are a lot of people who cannot sit in full lotus. So they'll sit cross-legged. Some people have hip issues and literally do the meditation sitting in a chair. If somebody's missing an arm, they'll only move that one arm, and that's totally fine. Okay, so essentially what you're saying is that even if people have you know, a pretty severe handicap, they can actually still go learn to practice. People have done the uh, exercises lying in bed before because of, of being in the hospital. Okay. All right, so, uh, so as you mentioned, uh, you, know, you can go to falundafa.org or you can just Google uh, Falun Dafa and you can find a free Falun Gong practice site uh, in, I guess, most major cities uh, around the world. Now, uh, what, we're, what we're watching here is the, a live parade that's happening right now in New York City with 10,000 Falun Gong practitioners uh, walking uh, through. Uh, they're now on 42nd Street and 3rd Avenue, uh, this group celebrating Falun Dafa Day. Uh, and Falun Dafa in a bunch of different countries. That's right. And I see the group with uh, different languages saying Falun Dafa in each respective country has uh, moved already to the Grand Central Station. Now, uh, again, if you're watching us uh, on social media, whether it's NTD Television's Facebook Live page or YouTube Live or on our website, ntd.tv, uh, you can leave your comments or questions, and we will actually answer those questions live on our show. Uh, now, I want to talk, uh, uh, get back to something that you sort of talked about uh, a bit earlier, which is, uh, you know, Falun Gong was, uh, was one of the many different, uh, there was m maybe more than 100 different Qigong practices that were public in China in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and Falun Gong was introduced in 1992. Now, Arping, sort of how did that, you know, there's just a small group in 92, and then what happened, you know, over the next few years? Well, um before Falun Gong came to public, there were already quite a you know, few dozen uh, different kind of a Qigong meditation exercise uh, in society, you know, very popular. When mm. Falun Gong you know, was introduced to the public, uh, the government recognized you know, immediately uh, that the practice is, uh, is free, as you mentioned earlier, mm. and it's very beneficial to health. So when the government sports commission decided you know, we need to promote public health, 
through the Falun Gong meditation exercise. So it became, you know, the most popular uh -huh. practice. So it's actually the most popular practice. Exactly. Now, actually, uh, Arping, I want to watch uh, a short video about yeah. Falun Gong yeah. in the 1990s, yeah. uh, and then we're going to go to our reporter, Felicia Lee, who's going to be interviewing a, a family of Falun Gong practitioners, not, not from China, but actually from Sweden. So let's watch that video first. In 1992, Mr. Li Hongzhi introduced Falun Gong to the public in northeastern China. It spread quickly by word of mouth. This local TV news report says that every morning you can see nearly a thousand citizens do Falun Gong exercises outside Shenyang City Hall. In Shanghai, news reports show 10,000 people practicing Falun Gong together. In Guangzhou, a news reporter interviewed this university professor from the South China University of Technology. Are there many highly intelligent scholars like yourself practicing Falun Gong? The reporter asks. There are hundreds of faculty members in our university who practice every day, says the professor. In 1998, Shanghai Cable TV reported that there are self-organized practice groups all across China. It says Falun Gong has also spread to countries in Europe, America, Asia, and Australia, and that there are about 100 million people practicing worldwide. Two thousand seventeen World Falun Dafa Day New York Parade. Hi guys, I'm here now with the Kleinert family from Sweden, Christina, Werner, and their two beautiful children. So I heard you started practicing Falun Dafa in a small town in nineteen ninety eight. How did you come to hear about it? It was actually relative to us from Switzerland. He uh, contacted us and said, You need to know about this fantastic Qigong practice from China, Falun Gong. I would like to come to Sweden and teach you. Okay. So the first time we practiced it, it was very strong. It was like, a, oh, what is this about? And we get very exciting to know more about it. We yeah. made quite a lot of research about Falun Gong. And eventually we find that this was something we wanted to practice more. Interesting. So what were the greatest changes that you made as a family after practicing Falun Dafa? Oh, there's lots of changes. But I can tell you, in the beginning, I, um, I was able to quit uh, smoke and tobacco very easy and uh, when I drink some wine or alcohol, things like that, I feel inside very bad and sad. So I felt this is a very powerful method and I also have a big back problem from my youth. I was in an accident there and uh, one night when I was practicing, something happened. I can feel something really physical happen and uh, after that, maybe 80 90 percent of this pain was gone so and this was in the beginning and then after that it's more and more things happen so this is a very nice yeah that's great yeah. Uh, what are the changes you've made as a family after practicing Falun Dafa I think in our daily life we always connect together and talking about life when it's problem or a lot of stress in our daily life we were thinking what is really life about? Is, is it all about money and success? Of course, this is a, a good part of it, but it's actually to try to apply the generation ran uh, all in our daily life. And, and when things happening on us, uh, maybe bad things are happening to us on, in the outside, after all, we try all to think about, yeah, what, what, what can we change inside ourselves yeah. Yeah. to cope with this in a yeah. good way? And here we have your beautiful daughters, uh, Indra, um, how have you incorporated the principles of truth, compassion, and forbearance into your daily life? Uh, I've been growing up with Falun Gong, and I can't imagine a life without it. The three principles, Chen, Shan, Ren, truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance, is my foundation in life. And what about you? Uh, in school, when a friend uh, is a little bit mean, I think about the three principles, and then I feel very calm in my heart and think, uh, uh, clear thoughts. It also helps me to take in what she has to say and understand her. So it's so great to hear how the practice has benefited so many people around the world, such as families like you. So we're going to head back now to the parade. All right, thanks so much, Felicia. Thank you, Felicia. Now, um, <clears throat> we're watching right now live the 2017 Falun Dafa Day live celebration in New York. New food wireless. Uh, this is the 18th <laughs> World Falun Dafa Day Parade. Uh, and the theme uh, for the celebration is 25 years of Falun Dafa. This parade is actually a huge uh, in scale. We're looking now at the section on 42nd Street near 3rd Avenue. 
uh, but it's actually stretching across Manhattan with 10,000 people stretching from the United Nations Plaza, and they're headed all the way to the west side of Manhattan, past Times Square, past Port Authority, all the way to the Hudson River. Um, and there's a bunch of uh, Falun Gong practitioners, or Falun Dafa, those two uh, are the same names for the same thing, Falun Dafa and Falun Gong. Uh, we've got Falun Gong practitioners here from Indonesia uh, and a bunch of different countries here. Uh, 10,000 people from more than uh, 50 different countries that have flown in uh, for this special occasion. That's right, and what we're seeing on screen right now is actually some Falun Gong practitioners dressed in traditional Chinese attire, and they're actually in these little miniature boats, and on the side it reads, Falun Dafa is wonderful. And that, that group has actually just left the beginning of the parade, whereas the ethnic groups have already reached towards the end, the western side. Yeah, now uh, for those of you who are watching now on Facebook Live, YouTube Live, or of course our website, ntd.tv, please feel free to leave your comments below right now, and we're going to actually be uh, answering some of those viewer questions uh, live on this show. And in fact, uh, one of the recent questions that we had, uh, we had a, a viewer, a Noble Michelle, who was asking, uh, where can I take Falun Dafa classes? Uh, and I understand you can go to falundafa.org.org. Or you can just Google Falun Dafa, and there's a website where you can find uh, more information about Falun Gong, and uh, there's different practice sites in almost every major city uh, around the world. Uh, and Zenon, you mentioned that uh, these classes, uh, they're, they're usually in parks, is that right? Yes, and that's because Falun Gong is free, and that was one of the things that drew me to Falun Gong when I first found it. Like it's completely free, they don't, there's no money at all? I had to ask the person two and three times just to make sure, because I had been <laughs> spending a lot of money learning all different kinds of practices in the past, and when I found this and it was free, they said, you know, uh, cultivation or the refinement of a person has nothing to do with money, and I was just another reason why I felt like I had found what I was looking for. Interesting. All right. Well, well, thank you for that. Now, what we're looking at now is this uh, the waste drum team. Um, you want to mention what that what the waste drum team? The was? Waste, waste drum team is essentially a group of Falun Gong practitioners who play these little drums, and uh, they're just a very uh, organized group of drum players. And uh, what's interesting about them is that uh, they're not just young people, but also some elderly ladies as well. And you can see some of those health benefits in real life. Uh, you, you can see they're full of vigor and um, enthusiasm. Yeah, we've actually got some some kind of older looking uh, aunties, I guess as you say yes. in Chinese, who look like they're in pretty great shape. They're in great shape. Yeah. Let's watch a, a minute of this here. For those of you who are just joining us, what we're watching right now is the 2017 Fallen Dafa Day live celebration in New York. And this is, again, it's happening right now live in New York. 10,000 Falun Gong practitioners are walking from the United Nations Plaza uh, all the way uh, across Manhattan on 42nd Street, past Grand Central Station, past Bryant Park, past Times Square, uh, all the way uh, past the Chinese consulate to the uh, Hudson River. Uh, and there's a bunch of different groups. Now, um, you know, a lot of the people that we've seen in the parade are actually millennials, um, you know, younger folks as well as, as well as older folks. That's right. It's not just um, a certain age group that finds Falun Gong appealing. In fact, in the parade, as you've seen in some of the shots, there are people from all different races, ethnicities, backgrounds, and, of course, different ages as well. So, you know, why are a lot of young people practicing Falun Gong? Well, we're going to watch a short video about Falun Dafa Day, uh, and then we're going to go to our on-site reporter, Felicia Lee, for more. May 13th is World Falun Dafa Day. This date was chosen to express gratitude to the founder of Falun Gong, known more traditionally as Falun Dafa. It's a mind-body practice that includes exercises, meditation, and spiritual teachings. Falun Gong's founder, Mr. Li Hongzhi, introduced the practice publicly in China for the first time on May 13, 1992. Since then, Falun Gong has been practiced by more than 100 million people worldwide, as practitioners often say they've received numerous physical, mental, and spiritual benefits from it. Every year since 2000, on and around May 13th, Falun Gong practitioners in countries and regions around the globe hold events to celebrate and spread Falun Gong. Two thousand seventeen World Falun Dafa Day New York Parade. So I'm
I'm here now with Annie Chen and Jason Liu, who are both currently attending college. So, Jason, can you tell me a little bit about how the practice has assisted you in applying for college and your life through there? As a Falun Dafa practitioner, one of our core principles is Jin Shanjin, which is truth, compassion, and forbearance. Right. When I was doing my college applications, one thing I really focus on is those three principles. Mm -hmm. For example, a lot of students who are joining clubs that they don't want to join, taking classes that they don't want to take just right. to impress college admission boards who are not being truthful. And one of the first thing I did was I stayed true to myself. I went to the path of pursuing my passions of doing startups, and that really helped me getting into Yale. Mm -hmm. And also compassion. You know, at the end of the day, no matter how good of a student you are, you have to be a compassionate human being. Right. And Falun Dafa, going through the cultivation, really helped me improve and cultivate my sense of heart. And I think college remission boards, at the end of the day, they're looking for that as well, because they don't want people who are just smart, but they're also compassionate human beings. Right, because well. it's a lifestyle. Exactly. And have you been able to spread the principles with your, col uh, your friends and colleagues? Yep, um, certainly with my friends, introducing, telling them about um, the persecution following going in China. I'm also trying to get my um, my loved ones to uh, cultivate as, as well mm -hmm. um, and to read the Zhuan Falun yes. um, and just starting up from there. Great. And how long do you have left of college? I still got three more years. <laughs> Not too long, but that'll go really quickly. So, Annie, can you tell me a little bit about uh, Right to Freedom and what the message is? Oh, um, Right to Freedom was like 3,000 miles, 30 young kids, um, and then with like one uh, strong message that we're trying to raise awareness about um, those people who are persecuted in China for just having their beliefs, especially like the young children there who cannot practice. Um, yeah. <laughs> and what made you want to join the ride? Were you a really good cyclist or what was it like? No, I like really not athletic at all. <laughs> but when I like heard about it, I was like, wow, I like really want to go. That sounds so amazing. And then um, I, I thought the mission was really um, like really spoke to me. And but then I realized like when I was doing the ride that it's actually really difficult. Um, and but like just thinking about the people in China, um, that they're being persecuted for just like this belief. I just thought that was a strong enough message for me to like keep persisting right. and going on through like 3,000 miles. Yeah. So we're really lucky here to be able to speak, you know, what we want to say about it and have that opportunity. So thank you guys for speaking with me today and we're going to head back to the parade. All right. Thank you so much, Felicia. That was really interesting and uh, good luck, uh, Annie and Jason, uh, in college. Uh, so what we're watching right now uh, is the uh, 2017 Falun Dafa Day live celebration in New York. And um, as you can see on screen, there are some Falun Gong practitioners who are dressed in all white and they're holding these photos. And actually, those photos are of Falun Gong practitioners who have been persecuted to death by the Chinese Communist Party. And, and we, we haven't quite started talking about this yet, but uh, if you practice Falun Gong in China today, you can actually be arrested, sent to a detention center or a labor camp, even torture to death for practicing Falun Gong in China. And that's actually happening right now. Uh, so you're mentioning about these people. Why, so why are they dressed in white, Yi? Well, actually, in traditional Chinese culture, white is the color of death. And as you can see, in this part of the parade, they have these solemn expressions. And they're remembering these practitioners who have been killed by the CCP for um, not giving up their belief in Falun Gong. And so Falun Gong has been persecuted in China since 1999. In fact, July 20th, 1999 is when uh, the Chinese uh, <clears throat> regime sort of started arresting practitioners en masse. Uh, so how did, how did this happen? Well, we're going to watch a short video about uh, July 20th, 1999. In 1998, the Chinese government estimated that between 70 and 100 million people in China were practicing Falun Gong. It was the most popular practice of its kind in Chinese history, but the leader of the Chinese Communist Party wanted it gone. In the early hours of July 20, 1999, public security bureaus carried out an organized operation to arrest the volunteer coordinators of Falun Gong practice sites throughout China. This was ordered by then-Chinese leader Shang Zemin. He declared that Falun Gong should be eliminated within three months. When his campaign failed to stop Falun Gong, he simply cracked down harder. Shang Zemin implemented a strategy to eradicate Falun Gong practitioners by ruining their reputations, crushing them financially, and eliminating them physically. He also declared that beating them to death counts as suicide. 
From 1999 to present, the Falun Gong website minghui.org has verified at least 4,000 cases of Falun Gong practitioners being persecuted to death, but some estimates suggest the true number of practitioners killed is actually several hundred thousand. In response to 18 years of brutal repression, Falun Gong practitioners inside and outside China have been unyielding in their efforts to expose the persecution through peaceful activities. Publications All right, thank you. And for those of you just joining us today, uh, we're talking about how the, the Chinese Communist Party has been persecuting Falun Gong for the last 18 years. Now, I have a question from one of our viewers, uh, and people who are watching us now on Facebook Live and YouTube Live and our website, and our viewer Sadie Chan asks, what was the main reason for the ban of this Falun Dafa practice in China then? Uh, so actually, Arping Zhang, who is the Falun Dafa Information Center spokesperson, Arping, could you answer that question? Well, there are quite a few reasons. Uh, the foremost reason is that, uh, as the report just mentioned, by the year 1998, the government of China found out there were over 100 million uh, practitioners of Falun Gong within China alone. Okay, so China has 1.3 billion people. So we're talking exactly. about like one out of every 13 Chinese people was practicing yes. Falun Gong. Yes, actually this was announced on the Shanghai local TV when they were promoting the exercise. So, so the local <coughs> news was promoting Falun Gong? Yes, because they were promoting the uh, public you know, health campaign for Falun Gong. But that was before 1999. When right, the but for like seven started. years they were promoting the health benefits. Yes, yes. And, uh, so, it's like, so, so everything suddenly changed in 99? Well, how that you work? know, when you have 100 million practitioners, you know, practicing Falun Gong in China, that outnumbers the membership of the Communist Party, which at that time was 60 million. So, so more people practicing Falun Gong than there were members of the Communist Party. Well, the I thing mean, is, so many of the people who practice Falun Gong are Communist members themselves. Oh, I see. And okay. also, they may be senior leaders and involving the government and also military. So for atheist political party, Communist Party, they feel threatened. Oh, because they're doing also the spiritual thing, but they're also party members operating yes. the it, government. It's not only atheists, it's also a matter of Falun Gong requires you to think for yourself. In order well, for Well, that you, sounds dangerous in China. In, right? Well, it, will, it would in any, any totalitarian regime which requires a, a, a monopoly on thought and for people to all think the same way, whereas Falun Gong specifically requires you to measure yourself against truth, compassion, and forbearance. There's nobody telling you how to practice or what to do. That all comes from you forcing that upon yourself and you evaluating those things, but that gets you thinking more and more and more as an individual. So essentially the Communist Party didn't want people having this kind of independent thinking based on these other principles, right? Because if you, if you believe, you know, truth, compassion, tolerance, maybe that doesn't, you know, coincide with the ideology that they're trying to promote or... Well, there's a fear you know, from the Communist Party that by embracing the values of truth, truthfulness, compassion, tolerance, there will be a revival of the traditional Chinese culture. And this, the, the revival of the traditional values will pose a direct threat to the communist ideology, which is class struggle. When you talk about truthfulness, compassion, tolerance, some scholars said, if everyone practiced truth, truthfulness alone, Chinese society will change because the Chinese government is feeding the me you know in, through the media a lot of propaganda that ah, are okay. untrue, and you know let alone you embrace the value of compassion, and the, the communist ideology is talking about class struggle, mm. and then you, you know alone and others you know come for barriers. Yeah. So it the, the values alone is so the, so the, the Communist Party saw the values as a threat, and, and, mm. and now for for the last uh, eighteen years. Uh, we've actually uh, heard that a lot of uh, Falun Gong practitioners have been, you know, arrested and tortured for this. How many uh, Falun Gong practitioners have been killed under the persecution over the last 18 years? Well, there are over 4,000 4, Falun Gong practitioners have been confirmed with names, and, you know, age and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, you have died of torture and persecution. But there are, you know, uh, many more. And we got this data, you know, sometimes we, we, we confirm one person who passed away several years ago. Uh, because there is a lack of, you know, the, you know tr the information transparency from China. So the data is, you know, uh, is incomplete. 
But okay, these, so the four thousand is only like a like a part of that. Those, those are the confirm. ones we are able to confirm yeah. one hundred yeah. percent through the okay. information yeah. blockade and control. So, so the, Communist the Communist Party has killed power. at least four thousand people yeah. just yeah. for practicing Falun Gong. Yes, well, and many more are arrested, yeah. of course, yeah. and still yeah. held in uh, yeah. detention centers and labor camps. And actually, persecuting such a large number of people is a huge task for the Chinese Communist Party. That's so like a major operation. It is right? a major yeah. operation, and actually, in nineteen ninety nine, they set up a special department just to deal with Falun Gong practitioners, and it was called the 610 Office. Now we're going to watch a short video about that. On June 10, 1999, the leader of the Chinese Communist Party created a group for handling the Falun Gong problem. That group created what came to be known as the 610 Office, named for the date of its establishment. Since then, the 610 Office has overseen China's nationwide persecution of Falun Gong. The 610 office exists above Chinese law, despite having no legal mandate. It's been given enormous financial resources. Reuters has compared the 610 office to the Nazi Gestapo or secret police. The 610 office has deep ties to the Chinese police, labor camps, state-run media, the court systems, schools, and universities, and even Chinese embassies around the world, directing them to carry out the Communist Party's persecution of Falun Gong. For nearly 18 years, the 610 office has been responsible for the mass surveillance, arrest, detention, and torture of millions of Falun Gong practitioners in China. The United States Congress and other members of the international community have repeatedly demanded the Chinese government to put an end to the 610 office. 2017 World Falun Dafa Day New York Parade. All right, welcome back. Uh, you're watching now the 2017 Falun Dafa Day live celebration in New York, where 10,000 people from around the world are right now live marching from the United Nations Plaza in New York uh, all the way uh, across uh, Manhattan to the Hudson River, passing by Bryant Park and Grand Central and Times Square. Uh, now, if you're watching us on YouTube Live or Facebook Live or our website, ntd.tv, uh, you can actually leave your comments below uh, and we'll try to answer some of those questions on our broadcast. And we've got a few questions uh, that I want to answer right now. We talked a bit about uh, how in China right now you can be persecuted even to death for practicing Falun Gong. Obviously not in New York, um, uh, but we've got a few questions. Uh, one is from Tom Lewis who asks, how can people help support Falun Gong? Uh, maybe Arping, you could answer that question. Well, you can write to your local congressmen or senators, and you can organize, you know, seminars to publicize, you know, what's going on there. And you can also write to media, uh, you know, to press, you know, uh, to express your opinion. Uh, there are ways of doing. Of course, there are NGOs and nonprofit organizations, uh, for human rights organizations. You can, you know, voice your opinions there. Okay. And there's petitions on the Friends of Falun Gong website. On the Falun Dafa information website, particularly, um, you know, uh, calling for an end to the atrocities in China, and for uh, encouraging uh, heads of state to to speak to China on the behalf of the persecuted Falun Gong practitioners as well. Okay, great, thank you, and I hope that answers your question. Uh, now, I want to talk about another component of the Chinese Communist Party's persecution of Falun Gong. Back in 2006, this TV network, NTD Television, uh, first reported on something called organ harvesting in China. Uh, that is, at the time, there were reports that a Chinese hospital called Su Jiatun was, in fact, uh, involved in removing vital organs from Falun Gong practitioners and then selling those organs for transplant on the black market. And this was actually sparked by testimony from a wife of a doctor who worked there. And this led some journalists and nonprofit organizations to start investigating. Now, although uh, the mainstream media has been pretty slow to report on organ harvesting, there is quite a mountain of evidence that's growing. So let's watch a short video about that organ harvesting, and then we'll go to our reporter, Ben Hedges, for more. We call it a new form of evil in the, on the world. It's never been done by any government in the past to take a large group of its own people and say, we're going to uh, kill you without any kind of a trial, uh, and we're going to sell your vital organ parts Starting at the end of 1999, the number of transplants taking place just exploded. China carries out more organ transplant surgeries than any country besides the United States. But unlike other countries, China has no effective organ donation program. 
Zhao Xu Huan was put in a Chinese labor camp because she practices Falun Gong. I'm absolutely convinced that over a long period from 1999 onwards, uh, organ harvesting from prisoners has been taking place, especially with Falun Gong. The military is making money off of it, the hospitals are making money off of it, the middlemen are making money off of it. And we talk about money, we're talking about a multi-million dollar operation. Millions of Falun Gong practitioners are being persecuted in China for their beliefs. In 1999, Communist Party leader Jiang Zemin issued orders to break them financially, ruin their reputations, and destroy them physically. Since then, thousands of Falun Gong practitioners have disappeared without a trace. Military hospitals get watched in China, okay? There is nothing they can do uh, without the party central taking note of what they're doing. Was this run by triads? No. This was run by the state. This was murder, and it came from the state. In 2006, two Canadians started to investigate allegations of forced organ harvesting in China. They found at least 52 points of circumstantial evidence, including websites of Chinese hospitals offering matching organs in less than a week. It, it's just not possible unless you have an unlimited source of organs. And these are people who are alive. We're talking about live donors. The actual transplant surgery itself was the form of execution. These were living people that were killed for their organs. 2017 World Falun Dafa Day New York Parade. Well, I'm here with Dr. Weldon Gilcrease. Thanks so much for being with us here today, Doctor. Thank you very much for having me. And so why don't you tell us a little bit about your work? Yeah, sure. I work as a medical oncologist. I'm an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Utah. And then I work as the deputy director for Doctors Against Forced Organ Harvesting. And tell us a little bit about the work that your organization does. Yeah, so, so Doctors Against Forced Organ Harvesting was started in 2007, a year after uh, some of the most horrific, uh, horrific uh, uh, um, reports were coming out of China that prisoners of conscience were being killed for organ, the organ trade. So China quickly became the second leading transplanters in the world after the United States within about five years without a, a formal organ donation or distribution system. So the organization started in 2007 to try to bring awareness to these atrocities. Wow. And, you know, I know that you were, your organization actually was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize last year. What was the work that you did to afford you that honor? Yeah, really, it's, two, it's twofold. I, I, one, of the, one of the things that we do is reach out to legislative bodies, such as the United Nations, our federal government here in the United States, as well as state governments and local governments, but really to try, try to raise awareness. But the other side of it is, is really raising awareness throughout the medical community through letter campaigns and then face-to-face -face talks and different uh, events that we, that we put on throughout the United States. And could you tell us about you were able to get some legislation through condemning organ harvesting? Is that right? Yeah, that's right. There, there's the, there was a federal uh, resolution, House Resolution 343, that was passed unanimously a, a year, about a year ago, just under a year ago. But also there's been a lot of state, state legislation that's been passed recently in Pennsylvania, uh, in Minnesota, and, and other states in the Midwest are, are passing resolutions at, at a state level. Wow. Yeah. No, that's, that's incredible. And so... Um, if people, why is it so important for people to support your organization? Yeah, that's a great question. I think one of the things that, that forced organ harvesting brings up, this is one of the worst human rights abuses that the world has ever seen. It's being carried out by the, the, the medical community. So I think the more that we know, the better. But also, there's really, there are two issues. One is that where the Chinese learning their transplant medicine, they're learning it from the West, from countries like the United States. So in, in ways, we're complicit with, with these crimes against humanity if we don't step up and stop it. And I also think it's just a basic human right, the right to believe. And if people want to help uh, supporting your organization, where can they yeah. find out more? So there's, there's a website, dafoh.org and stoporganharvesting.org are both great websites to learn more information. 
So guys, if you want to find out more about these atrocities or even support the organization yourself, it's dafoh.org. That stands for Doctors Against Forced Organ Harvesting, doesn't it? Or stoporganharvesting.org. Thanks so much for talking with Thank us today. Thank you so much, Ben. Thanks for having me. Back Thanks, Ben. Very informative. And uh, for everyone who's just joining us, this, again, is NTD's special live coverage of the 2017 Falun Dafa Day Parade, and it's happening in New York City right now. And uh, what we see on screen is some Falun Gong practitioners who are holding up banners that say, Jiang Zemin, responsible for mass persecution. And Jiang Zemin is actually the former head of the Chinese Communist Party, and he's the one who's primarily responsible for uh, persecuting and targeting Falun Gong practitioners. Now, I want to answer some questions that folks are leaving uh, below this live video on Facebook Live and on YouTube Live. Now, the first question comes from Christian Fredrickson, which is, how do you start? The answer to that is you can go to the uh, Falun Dafa website, which is falundafa.org, or you can just Google Falun Dafa or Google Falun Gong, and you can find uh, information about it as well as a practice site that where it's taught for free. As you mentioned, Zenin, it's taught for free in uh, almost every major city. Um, next question is, is from uh, Rabia Katun, who asks, what does Falun Dafa mean? And now, uh, Arping, maybe you could answer that question briefly. Uh, Falun means, uh, in, uh, in, in traditional Buddhist school, there's the, the talk about the will of law. And uh, Dafa means a great way, which is the will of the law, great way, the great way of will of law. In other words, it means the, uh, uh, in Buddhist school, we believe you know, everything go around in a circle. And uh, so it's the, the law of the will. Okay. Yeah. And uh, well, another viewer, uh, Richard G. and Freddie, asks, is there any verbal component of Falun Gong? Do you have to learn prayers or chants in Chinese, like mantras and meditation? No. Uh, we don't have that. No. Okay, so the answer is no. <laughs> no uh, now, I want to get back to what we're watching now uh, in the parade, because we were talking about a, a much more serious uh, issue, which is that if you practice Falun Gong, Anywhere in the world, you can practice it freely, but inside China is the exception to that. And inside China, you can actually be arrested, sent to a labor camp, tortured even to death. Uh, and we just had an interview with doctors against forced organ harvesting, talking about how in China, uh, Chinese state-run hospitals and other hospitals are actually uh, killing Falun Gong practitioners for their organs and then uh, selling those organs on the black market. It's a pretty gruesome thing, and it's kind of hard to believe that you know, this is happening right now in 2017. Um, so, Arping, you know, uh, what is sort of the latest estimate? How many Falun Gong practitioners have been killed for their organs? Well, we don't have a really the accurate number because, uh, you know, the, the information and censorship in China. But um, the Chinese government claimed that, you know, each year they have over 10,000 organ transplant, also up to 20,000, you know, uh, organ transplant. And in, 19, in the early, uh, tr uh, early of this century, uh, you know, at the turn of the, the uh, around 2002, I believe, mm -hmm. in Madrid, they have a World Medical Association conference. The Chinese Vice Minister of Health, Huang Jiefu, claimed that over 90% of organs come from so-called executed prisoners. But according to the uh, MC International uh, calculation, in China, you know, the average speaking, they execute about 3,000 prisoners. Well, so you're saying there's, data. there's more, uh, the number of organ transplants carried out is much more than the actual number of exactly. prisoners Exactly, the killing. data don't match. And, and, they, and they don't have, China doesn't have like a, a national organ transplant well, this is system. Well, this is because of the Asian Chinese belief, the tradition. Uh, in China, they believe the person should be buried in total part. You cannot separate a body part after a person died. Of course, today, people, you know, like Western culture, they criminate, you know, right, uh, the bodies afterwards. Now. But you don't separate the body parts to donate any part, and, and then you criminate it or bury it. That's against traditional Chinese belief. This goes back to thousands of years. This is why we don't have a you know, sound public donation system in China. I see. When you have so many operations or transplantations without a public donation, then the question is, China ranked number two behind the United States in the world in terms of the number of organ transplantation. Then where did the organ come from? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty important question, and yeah. I think that's 
the most severe aspect of the persecution yeah. of Falun Gong that we're seeing right now in China. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sort of because of this persecution, I think what we've seen around the world over the last 18 years is a lot of Falun Gong okay. practitioners uh, organizing different events, organizing sort of, a, you know, peaceful resistance uh, to raise awareness about that. And in fact, uh, in London, uh, there's been a project to counteract the persecution of Falun Gong that's been ongoing since 2002 for 15 years now. So we're going to watch a quick video about that, and then we'll go to our uh, reporter from the UK, Ben Hedges, who are gonna, who's going to talk to someone involved in that. They've been here every day since June 5th, 2002, outside the Chinese embassy in London. Falun Gong petitioner in UK, we set up this uh, protest to send the clear message to the Chinese embassy. Stop torture, stop killing, stop persecution Falun Gong. Sometimes a group, sometimes just one person. But it's never stopped. The heat of summer, the wet cold of winter, every day and all night they hold vigil. It's been 5,457 days. We collect petitions here and we give them to Downing Street and it goes towards Amnesty International. Making their voice heard. It just seems like the right thing to do and to be showing a positive presence outside the Chinese embassy. Standing up against the Chinese regime, calling for freedom for Falun Gong inside China. 2017 World Falun Dafa Day New York Parade. Well, I'm now here with three Falun Gong practitioners from London in the UK. Now, in London, they have a 24-hour protest outside the Chinese embassy. Uh, Gao Yudong here is actually a coordinator of that. Could you tell us how it started? Actually, the protest started back to 2000 years in uh, October. It's uh, initially by a British gentleman, and uh, he's a retired uh, head teacher. And persecution Falun Gong in China started in 1999. So, but Chinese mainland petitioner, they keep going to Beijing to peaceful appeal, but they face uh, arrest and the labor camps detention center and even being lost killed for life. But for Western society, it looks like it's, it's a persecution for basic human rights. It's a persecution of a freedom of belief and also the persecution for the universal value of a truthful and compassion tolerance. So, and he built, he, he wants to stand up to help, to do something. And in October, 1st October, it happened in Tiananmen Square, and many, many people been dressed. And uh, he told us he wants to go to the embassy, Chinese embassy in London, to start a peace protest. And, and later you all joined him and it became 24 hours, is that right? When was that? Yes, and uh, because the persecution is uh, ongoing and even become more and more horrible. So in 2002, so we started 24 hours, wow. seven days. And so it's been, well, since then it's been 24 hours, seven days a week. I just want to talk to you two now, so you have both taken part in this uh, protest what's it like for you um yeah i go there in the evenings and uh, it, i feel like it's an honor to be part of uh, clarifying the truth about what's happening the persecution and it's a good way to be a living example of what we believe in is truth compassion tolerance because we're telling the truth we're compassionate that's why we're there and we also endure and forbear you know we forbear the weather and uh, we're determined to keep going until the persecution ends and uh, Vicky, what about for you? How, how, how is the protest for you? Um, I find it's a really, it's actually an amazing experience because it's so peaceful to be able to meditate as a protest. Um, it feels like it's, you know, it's really important. The, the people in the embassy must see us there day after day after day meditating peacefully as a protest. And I think they must sort of question themselves, you know, with this horrific persecution going on, you know, it, it's people like us who are being persecuted and we're there peacefully meditating and that's what the practice is about and as Tilly said truthfulness compassion tolerance so. well thank you so much and I wish you good luck with the protest now let's return to the parade all right thank you so much Ben Hedges uh, wow 15 years uh, holding vigil outside the Chinese Embassy is pretty incredible um, what we're seeing right now uh, is 10,000 Falun Gong practitioners uh, in New York City, walking from the United Nations Plaza all the way to the Hudson River uh, along 42nd Street. 
And this is called the uh, 2017 Fallen Daffa Day Live Celebration in New York. And fascinatingly enough, this is actually the third Tianguo marching band that we're seeing on screen right now. And uh, as we mentioned before, the Tianguo marching band is the largest Chinese marching band, or Chinese majority marching band, that is located outside of China. Yeah, and that's actually, uh, there's 600 uh, members of the Tianguo marching band, and it's split into three sections. This is the third of three sections of oh, about 200 people. It's uh, mostly people of Chinese descent, although it's a mix of people from different countries. Um, now, we were just talking earlier uh, about the uh, persecution of Falun Gong. Uh, and there's an interesting thing uh, that actually happened in 2001. Uh, this photo is actually pretty remarkable. Uh, we're going to look into that uh, with a short uh, video. On November 20th, 2001, 36 Falun Gong practitioners from 12 countries gathered in Tiananmen Square in Beijing, China. They were all Westerners. They held up a large banner with the words, Truth, Compassion, Tolerance. They were immediately surrounded by police vans. The police beat them, threw them in the vans, and detained them under orders from the Chinese Communist Party. Their crime? Peacefully calling for an end to the persecution of millions of Falun Dafa practitioners in China who have been arrested, tortured, and killed by the CCP. The event attracted the attention of major media outlets around the world that led to the intervention by the British, French, American, Canadian, Australian consulates in China. The Chinese police had no choice but to release and deport these Falun Gong practitioners back to their home countries. So I'm here now with Kay Rubacek, who was one of the practitioners who went to Tiananmen Square in Beijing in 2001 to protest. Kay, would you be able to tell me a bit about what compelled you to go and was this your first time in China? It was my first time in China and I, I really, it was really hard to believe that people would persecute Falun Gong because then I'd, I'd practiced Falun Gong for a number of years by then and and, and just, just seeing the reports of people going to Tiananmen Square and being arrested and then being thrown into prison, it was just really hard to bear knowing that was going on. And then when I heard that there was um, uh, some American uh, Caucasians going, um, then I thought, well, maybe it's time. And, and so I, I said, oh, I'm going to go too. Can you describe a little bit about what it was like being there and what was going through your mind at the time? I mean, I was, I was pretty naive. I really didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know if I would be arrested. I didn't know if, if they would not arrest us because, you, you know, we're Caucasian. I, I didn't know. But um, I, I really didn't think they were going to, like, really hurt me, yeah. like, kill me. But um, I, I just really, I really had no idea. I, I had no idea. So what was one of the biggest draws that you gained from going on that trip? I saw it with my own eyes. I saw, um, I saw what the police did to someone that held a banner that said truth, compassion and tolerance. I held the banner, it was, I had the last the sign compassion yeah. and then for that, for holding that, yeah. that's why I was arrested for holding that word. And so I saw that with my own eyes and I got to speak to the police, some of them spoke English and they really believed that I was sent by the CIA that I was paid by the American government yeah. um, and they really, it, it, being able to tell them that uh, people around the world practice Falun Gong um, was was quite precious because they really they really believed that every country persecuted Falun Gong at the time. That's what the police believed, and seeing that with my own eyes was just really eye opening. Well, thank you for sharing with us your first hand experience of going to Beijing in Tiananmen Square, and we're going to head back now to the parade. Thanks for that, Felicia. And uh, Kay Rubicek, it's really interesting. Uh, apparently, the Chinese police thought that an Australian Falun Gong practitioner was sent by the American CIA to hold a sign that says compassion. Uh, pretty, pretty unusual. Now, I want to talk about something related to that. And we've, we've got with us in the studio uh, Zenin Dolniki, uh, who's been practicing Falun Gong for a couple of decades. Now, Zenin, I want to talk about uh, something related. And uh, Jimmy, could you just roll clip 27, please? It's the Great Wall of China. <laughs> Uh, so, who is Zen? Who is that guy? Uh, looks like on the Great Wall of China. That's me. I went with uh, a friend of mine, and uh, we didn't know to what degree we'd be able to be um, able even to get to Tiananmen Square. Well, look at that that sign. What does that say there? The sign says Falun Dafa Hao, and we wanted to make sure that we it means Falun Dafa is wonderful, Falun Dafa is good, and we wanted to make sure that that sign made it from 
Westerners to, to China mm -hmm. uh, in the event we got arrested before being even able to make it to Tiananmen Square. So you shot that wall, uh, that, that video on the Great Wall of China. Correct. And that was 2001. Yes. Right, you look, you look pretty, uh, how, how old were you at the time, Zenon? 2001, so I was uh, 20, 21, something like that, 22. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And so you were with that group. You went with, with Kay Rubicek as well? I did not go with her, and I did not know who would be there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I originally planned on going because we had gotten a lot of media coverage in Canada, and we felt pretty good that Canadians were educated that the persecution of Falun Gong was happening, and so we wanted to do something more. And so we started to plan a trip to, to China. We then heard other people were... And so we just found out what date it was, and we just made sure to go on the same day as them and go to the same part of the square, uh, of the square as them. But I had no okay. idea how many people would be there. And, and that photo we just <clears> saw uh, of those people holding up a sign, truth, compassion, tolerance, that was not, you were not in that photo. I was. You were. So I was behind the banner you, holding you it up behind. in the air. And yeah, so, yeah. so what happened to you uh, right after that photo was taken? Well, we got encircled with uh, a bunch of police vans so that nobody could see us, and then they began to tear the banner away and, and, and pull people and beat people into the vans. And uh, I and ran so out. This is, so this is you here, right, with the yes. Canada t-shirt? Yes, we all wore our flags from our respective countries so that Chinese people could see that other countries didn't persecute Falun Gong and that uh, people were enjoying that practice and were against the persecution. So they took you, what, to a detention center and then? There was a police station in Tiananmen Square, uh, or right, right beside Tiananmen Square that we were all taken to. So a police station that was just for, like, arresting Falun Gong practitioners, basically? Um, or protesters I'm sure it was different used types. that way since 90, 1999 a lot mm -hmm. because of the volume of a peaceful appeals that were taking place from Falun Gong practitioners pretty consistently for years. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, then, and then how long did you stay in the detention center, and then what happened? Uh, we were kept in there for, well, I would say, four to six hours, and then uh, moved to uh, remote sites which where we were held before being put on planes. There was over ten countries, foreign affairs offices, calling China, saying, give us our people back. So the pressure was, was pretty intense. And, and, and it's a unique time because it shows what the pressure from foreign governments can do. And when China is wielding its economic strength and saying, you know, we, we have trade and be quiet on human rights, when they actually do speak up, uh, you can save lives. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm an example of that. Interesting. Uh, now, I want to go back to the uh, parade. Uh, and what we're, what we're looking at right now uh, is the uh, parade, the 2017 Fallen Dauphin Day live celebration in New York. We've got uh, 10,000 Fallen Gong practitioners uh, marching across New York City. These banners here, Yi, uh, what does that, uh, those so banners say? They, they read various things. Some of them say, um, um, uh, disintegrate the Chinese Communist Party, um, uh, reviving Chinese culture, and also uh, saying the spread of nine commentaries. All right, so, so the nine yeah. commentaries, uh, you know, what, what are the nine commentaries? Well, let's take a quick look at a video about the nine commentaries. The Nine Commentaries on the Communist Party is a series of editorials published in November 2004 by the Epic Times newspaper, first in Chinese, then in English. Today, the series has spread worldwide as a book. It's available in at least 33 languages, and it's inspired a set of TV documentaries as well. The Nine Commentaries is openly critical of the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, and its use of brutality to rule over the Chinese people. It reveals the CCP's true history, a history that Chinese textbooks and government propaganda have buried for decades. The systematic use of torture and brainwashing, the billions of dollars spent on labor camps, and the cover-up of mass murder. Within a few weeks of publication in Chinese, the Epic Times began getting statements from Chinese citizens saying they wanted to withdraw from the CCP. As more statements came in, the Epic Times started publishing them. This led to what's now called the Tuidang movement, or the withdrawing from the party movement. Today, more than 270 million Chinese people have withdrawn or renounced their affiliation with the CCP. 2017 World Falun Dafa Day New York Parade. So as we can see in the parade, there are still practitioners, Falun Gong practitioners who are holding signs and balloons, colorful balloons that are walking, walking our way. And they're talking about, we just saw a video about the, the nine commentaries on the Communist Party, which is an editorial series and a book. Now, Arping, uh, you've read this nine commentaries on the Communist Party. Uh, for viewers who haven't read it, what generally is it about? 
Well, it's a group of uh, overseas uh, Chinese scholars who have gone through the, uh, uh, you know, lives under communist rule. They feel safe to write about it in the uh, free, you know, world. In basically, most writers in the United States, they are writing about, you know, how the Communist Party got started in 1921 up to today, going through, you know, different uh, stages from you know, prior to 1949. They took over the China, defeating the uh, Chiang Kai-shek. And then they talk about the anti-rightist movement in the 50s, and then the Cultural Revolution starting in the uh, 60s. Right, so there are all these different campaigns uh, during the you know, 40s, 50s, 60s to sort of persecute different groups of Chinese yes, people. Yes, the, th this is the first book, for the first time, there's a book systematically you know, disclosing information Using the Chinese Communist Party documents, some of the documents, you know, so are it's actually popular. kind of a historical book exactly. that looks at these documents that haven't really been, uh, you know, s haven't really seen the public light very much. Exactly, it's a, it's a systematic narrative of what happened to the Communist Party from mm -hmm. beginning to up to today. The and, interesting and, thing is, the Harvard Law School has a Berkman Center for Internet and Society. They worked with the University of Toronto and Cambridge University do a testing on the censorship in China, digital censorship, they found out the number one censored item is the non-commenter. So the non-commenters is yes. definitely banned in China. <laughs> it's not only totally banned, it's well, ranks it, number one. It's the number wow. one banned book, nine commentaries on yes. the so, so go read the nine commentaries, the number one banned yeah. book. But so actually for people who are watching, uh, how can they read the nine commentaries? Well, it's online for free, both in Chinese version and the English version. Oh, in English as well, yes, okay. Yes. All right, now, uh, now an interesting thing actually happened uh, after the nine commentaries was published in 2005. Um, you know, and, and as the video we, uh, we saw just now mentioned, uh, it sparked this thing called the Tuidong movement, which roughly means you know, quitting or withdrawing from the, the Chinese Communist Party. And since then, more than 270 million people have, have done just that. It's renouncing the party. Uh, Arking, what is the significance of this Tuidong movement? It, it's very significant because uh, as a child, when you, are, you grow up in China, you, most of them become a right guard, you know, little right guard in elementary school, a right guard in high school, and then communist youth, and then the communist party. So there are three phases you know, three uh, associations, affiliations with the Communist Party. So by denouncing or renouncing this membership, they are kind of, you know, say, hey, I don't want to be associated with these gangsters. It's like you are, if you're a mafia, you know, a gangster organization, you, you don't want to try to be a murderer or try to be a someone who is doing, you know, crimes. In this case, it's crime against humanity. So you are, you are you're renouncing, you know, you know, distancing yourself from, you know, an organization that, uh, you know, routinely violates, you know, fundamental human rights. Mm. And so the, the, the leader of the Chinese Communist Party in 99 who started, you know, persecuting Falun Gong was uh, a guy named Jiang Zemin. Yeah. Uh, and actually he had spent uh, about 500 million U.S. dollars just in 2001 to build brainwashing centers and labor camps to persecute Falun Gong. And he's directed billions more of the country's resources over the next several years to arrest uh, and torture and murder Falun Gong practitioners. Uh, and now, uh, what we're seeing in the parade, uh, as well as what we're seeing kind of around the world, is Falun Gong practitioners calling on Jiang Zemin, uh, or calling for him to be put on trial for his crimes. Uh, so let's watch a quick video on that, and then we'll go to our reporter, Ben Hedges, for more. Jiang Zemin, once the powerful head of the Communist Party, he rose to power after supporting the bloody 1989 crackdown in Tiananmen Square. Ten years later, he launched a new brutal campaign, this time targeting Falun Gong. But recently, Jiang Zemin has been facing legal action. In 2009, Spain's national court issued an arrest warrant for Jiang Zemin for genocide and the persecution of Falun Gong. In the same year, an Argentine federal judge ordered the arrest of Jiang Zemin. Taking action against Jiang inside China is harder, and it's also risky for Chinese citizens to get involved. But that seems to be changing since May 1, 2015. That's when a new Chinese policy dictated that, quote, all cases filed according to law must be heard and dealt with, unquote. Many Chinese citizens took this as a green light to file legal complaints against Jiang. 
Today, more than 200,000 Falun Gong practitioners and their families have filed complaints with China's legal equivalent of the Supreme Court and the Department of Justice. They're calling on the Chinese legal system to bring Zhang to justice for his crimes against Falun Gong, including abuse of power, assault, unlawful detention, and homicide. 2017 World Falun Dafa Day New York Parade. Hi everyone, I'm here with Wang Zhiyuan, who is the president of the World Organization uh, to investigate the persecution of Falun Gong. And he's going to be talking to us uh, about the uh, Tui Dang, which is quitting the Communist Party. Uh, first of all, behind us we just have the Tian Guo marching band who are going past. Uh, drummers, all Falun Gong practitioners uh, based all over the world. Uh, they have bands in multiple countries. And this is the New York band that's performing for us right now. So we'll just wait for them to pass for a couple of moments. Uh, we have flutes and various brass instruments all coming past. Uh, so, Wang Zhiyuan, uh, oh, now, um, what I want to ask is that um, right now there's a trend of people in China quitting the Communist Party. And I'd like to know, uh, you know, what effect this is having. So, uh, so in addition to quitting the party right now, there's also uh, over 200,000 people from mainland China have actually sued, filed lawsuits against Jiang Zemin, who is the former uh, president of China, former leader of the Communist Party, uh, and the instigator of the persecution of uh, Falun Gong. In addition, there are Chinese immigrants in 28 other countries who's also filed uh, lawsuits. Do you think the Jiang Zemin is the impact of the society? The Falun Gong is Jiang Zemin, the impact of China, and the impact of the world society. 在不只要在一开始的半年的时间，光唐山一地就有两万七千六百四十一人签名按手印支持肃将。Well, so it's it's happening very fast, and even in the first six months of this movement, uh, there were over twenty-seven thousand six hundred people filing lawsuits just in the one region of uh, Tangshan in mainland China. And so finally, um, 把江泽民呃绳之以法，真的可能吗？ 完全可能，而且是必然的，而且很会，还会很快就到来。So he said he really believes that it will be possible to bring Jiang Zemin to justice for his crimes against against for man uh, against humanity, uh, and it is actually inevitable and will happen very soon. Thank you. 因为啊，活在法轮功学院器官，这是人类历史上从没有过的邪恶，而且是全国大范围范围的做。这件事情一旦曝光，伴随的是中共的解体，江泽民的。so he says that the live organ harvesting from Falun Gong practitioners is a type of evil that has never happened in the world before. And as soon as more information about this is made public, it will bring about the demise, the crumbling of the Chinese Communist Party, and Jiang Zemin will be brought to justice. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll go back to the parade. Well, thank you, Ben. That was some excellent Chinese on your part. And when we were introducing him, we failed to mention that actually our reporter, Ben, speaks fluent Mandarin. And uh, as you can see, uh, what you're watching now is actually the 18th World Falun Dafa Day Parade, and it's actually coming towards the end of that. Right, and it's happening right now in New York City. Uh, about 10,000 Falun Gong practitioners are marching from the United Nations Plaza in New York along 42nd Street, past famous landmarks like uh, Grand Central Station and uh, Times Square, and going all the way to the Hudson River. Uh, now, in the interview uh, that we just saw, uh, the interview we talked a bit about this thing called the, the Tuedong Movement, which is a movement where more than 270 million people have, uh, you know, renounced their affiliation. So let's take a quick look uh, at that Tuedong Movement with this short video. Tuedong, it's a grassroots movement that's challenging the rule of the Chinese Communist Party. Most people outside China have never heard of it, but it could play a key role in determining China's future. Tui means to withdraw or quit. Dang refers to the Chinese Communist Party. 
More than 270 million people have issued Tweedong statements, announcing they are withdrawing from the Chinese Communist Party and its affiliated organizations. Some of those people who've participated in Tweedong directly ended their current party membership. Others are former members. They joined the party at some point in their life, or as kids they joined the Communist Youth League or the Young Pioneers, or they had other connections to the party. The Tweedong movement is an expression of what's in people's hearts. It shows how a huge segment of Chinese society, roughly 20% so far, have renounced the Communist Party. They're saying they want to see a future for China without it. Two thousand seventeen World Falun Dafa Day New York Parade. The Epoch Times newspaper, this Chinese newspaper, says that that there are uh, more than two hundred and seventy million people who have withdrawn from the Chinese Communist Party in this Tweedong movement. But you know the the Chinese Communist Party uh, only you know they say they have uh, eighty nine million members. So there's you know two hundred and seventy plus million people who've who've quit the party or left the party, but only 89 million members. So how does that, you know, what's the discrepancy all about? Are these all party members who there, quit? There's no discrepancy. I, accurate, accurately speaking, it should be there are 270 million people uh, renounce their membership with Communist Party affiliate organizations. Okay, because the uh, signs, they say quit CCP, but yeah, the translation but, of Tway is a little different, yeah, right? Yeah, it's really uh, in all the affiliate organizations, such as the Red Guard, the little red guard, you know, all the people who went through the elementary and the high school in China, majority of them are red guard, you know, members. And then there, there is a communist youth membership. Okay, so and that's not included when the Communist Party says we have 89 million members. They're not including the Youth League or the no, Young Pioneers no, no, or the, no, red, the guard red Guard or any of those. Exactly. Then, okay. then the, the, uh, for the Communist Party uh, membership, uh, you know, which is third level, uh, it's not everyone can join it in China. Mm -hmm. You have you have to apply and you have to be approved and proven to be loyal to the to the to the party before they can uh, you know give you uh, uh, the membership. Because the, the, coming with membership, you have, there are a lot of perks. You mm -hmm. have probably better opportunity to get promoted in the government in certain jobs. You know, get access to a certain uh, wealth. So that's actually a pretty bold thing then to to withdraw from the party when you have you know the opportunity for all these benefits. Exactly. That's that's why if people choose to renounce such a membership, renounce association with, you know, Communist Party affiliate organizations. And that means they, you know, they have, you know, uh, the conscience has uh, wake up and they don't want to enjoy those perks and rather to choose, uh, you know, go along with the conscience and, uh, and, and side with history and justice. So, uh, you know, this movement, which has been growing over the last uh, 10 years, uh, what kind of impact do you think this is going to have over the next five to ten years in China? Well, that means people are, are waking up to the reality of society, reality of the Communist Party rule, and they are witnessing, you know, through the over the, all the political campaigns and persecution that this party is not speaking for the people, it's not, you know, uh, it's going against the traditional values. So when people stand up and they want to, you know, basically it's a matter of choice whether people want to choose a different direction than the one that is moving, controlled by the Communist Party. And, and in okay. practicing truth, compassion, and forbearance, I mean, we want good things for people. And uh, just like children have been abused by their parents, imagine your parents are you know, psychotic and senile and torturing and killing your cousins and your extended family for many decades. There's a huge therapeutic component, uh, a relief of stress, a disassociation, a feeding of your soul, to differentiate yourself from that corrupt, criminal type of behavior. So there's a, a strengthening of the Chinese people's collective spirit and conscience by having an, a, a public uh, opportunity to do something like, like that. Like kind of a catharsis, like what we saw after apartheid in yeah, South Africa. I would, I would want to do it every day if I was living in China, you know what I mean? <laughs> now, I, I want to get back to something, you know, uh, because right now what we're watching uh, live right now is this uh, 2017 Falun Dafa Day live celebration in New York. And we talked about this movement that's kind of related to how the Communist Party has been persecuting Falun Gong in China. Uh, but Falun Gong itself, you know, a lot of our uh, folks who've been commenting on Facebook Live and YouTube Live have been asking us, you know, what is this Falun Gong? Uh, and we talked about that earlier in the parade, but I want to get back to it. Uh, so let's watch a brief video about, you know, what is Falun Gong? 
Falun Dafa, also known as Falun Gong, is an advanced self-cultivation practice that improves mental and physical wellness through physical exercises and the development of one's character. In China, cultivation practices have a history of thousands of years and form the spiritual foundation of Chinese civilization. In 1992, Falun Dafa was introduced to the public by Master Li Hong Zhu. The practice quickly spread because of its profound principles and proven health benefits. By 1999, with over 100 million practitioners, Falun Dafa had grown to become the largest practice of its kind in China and around the world. I feel an energy in my body that's very subtle and hard to describe, but it feels very good. I could have very little sleep and I'll feel awakened, but not like a coffee energetic, like a very calm and collected energy. And that one hour it can feel like a day, and then I'm refreshed and, and ready to go. So before I practiced Falun Gong, when I got scolded by my boss or supervisor, I was very annoyed and immediately I would complain about others, you know, or felt it wasn't fair. But after I started practicing, the biggest lesson I learned was looking inside and always find something to improve within myself. At the core of Falun Dafa are the values of truthfulness, compassion, and forbearance. Falun Dafa teaches that these are the supreme qualities of the universe and takes them to be a guide for daily life and practice. Two thousand seventeen World Falun Dafa Day New York Parade. Hi, welcome back to NTD. For those of you just joining us, uh, this is a special live broadcast of the 18th World Falun Dafa Day Parade. Now, this year's theme is celebrating 25 years of Falun Dafa, which is also called Falun Gong. Uh, tomorrow, uh, May 13th, is also the 66th birthday of the, of the founder of Falun Gong, Mr. Li Hongzhi. On May 13th, 1999, Mr. Li Hongzhi officially introduced Falun Gong to society. Uh, 1992, I believe, right? So oh. 25 years ago. Yes. But it is, 1999 was the first, uh, was when the persecution That's against correct. Falun Gong first It's actually began. 1992 when the practice was first introduced. And he actually introduced it first in China in Changchun City, which is in uh, northeastern China. And the fees for that, seminar, for that seminar were actually the lowest among all Qigong practices in the country. And as you mentioned before, Matt, Qigong was very popular at that time. And he was giving these like nine or ten day uh, long seminars all across uh, China. In fact, uh, from the two years from May 13th, 1992 to December 12th, 1994, uh, he accepted invitations uh, from different Qigong uh, scientific research associations and, and other groups. And he gave 56 lectures in two years. So that'd be like... You know, every, uh, every 14 days on average, he was giving like a nine or 10 day lecture seminar, which is a, it's a pretty grueling uh, two and a half years. And around 20,000 people inside China uh, attended uh, one or more of these various lectures. And so pretty, uh, pretty soon, word of Falun Gong spread by word of mouth, uh, and eventually millions of people were practicing. Uh, so let's take a quick uh, look at who is the founder of Falun Gong, Mr. Li Hongzhi. Master Li was born on May 13, 1951, in Jilin Province, China. From a young age, he was trained as a disciple in Falun Xiulian Dafa, an ancient Qigong practice to cultivate mind and body. After several decades of arduous training, Mr. Li had reached a high level of both skill and spiritual insight. At that point, he decided to introduce the practice to the general public. After thorough preparation, on May 13, 1992, Mr. Li introduced this practice to the public, calling it Falun Gong. Falun Gong spread quickly in China as practitioners shared accounts of remarkable physical and mental benefits from the practice. Practitioners respectfully call him Master Li, a traditional title for a Qigong teacher in China. Master Li received numerous awards from Chinese state institutions for his work alleviating illnesses across China. 
In 1995, the Chinese embassy in France invited Mr. Li to travel to Paris to give a workshop. Master Li and Falun Gong have continued to enjoy widespread popularity despite the Chinese Communist Party's campaign to smear him since 1999. From 2000 to 2003, Master Li Hongzhi was nominated four times for the Nobel Peace Prize. He has received hundreds of awards and recognitions worldwide, including recognition as an outstanding spiritual leader by the Asia Pacific Human Rights Foundation. He is ranked among one of the top 100 living geniuses, a list compiled by the global consulting firm Creators Synetics. Today, as many as 100 million people worldwide practice Falun Gong and live by its principles of truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance. Zhen Shan Ren. 2017 World Falun Dafa Day New York Parade. You know, uh, in a lot of religions, uh, you know, the, the followers will donate some money to their religious institutions as a way of expressing gratitude. Now, Zenin, you've been practicing Falun Gong for about two decades. Uh, how does that work in Falun Gong? Uh, that's, that's actually, it's prohibited. And as my understanding of, of, of one of the reasons that is, is because um, it, it, it really can stir people's um, heart in a so, way that, so you're saying that there's no there's no money there's no donations of any kind in Falun Gong no no uh, if if I wanted to uh, um, uh, build a really nice sign for the practice site that I host in the park by my house I can go do that with my own money because I want to make my practice site look nice but um, there's no place to donate money to um, in, in Falun Gong and there's no one to pay money to because that's prohibited in in the propagation and spread of the practice Okay. Uh, now, uh, we talked earlier uh, in this broadcast about how inside China, uh, Falun Gong is actually being persecuted. If you practice Falun Gong in China today, uh, you can actually be arrested uh, or tortured. And uh, we're looking at this parade uh, where Falun Gong practitioners are raising awareness uh, about Falun Gong. And uh, we're getting towards the end of the parade, actually. But I want to talk, um, you know, a little bit about uh, Falun Gong and why it's being persecuted. Because we have a, a comment from one of our viewers on Facebook Live. Uh, Sally Barat asks, why aren't they allowed to practice Falun Gong uh, in China, I think she means, uh, and what has the government got against it, that, that they harvest organs f alive from these poor people? I think it's important for us to uh, address a little bit about semantics, politics, and the use of the word government. Oftentimes, uh, you know, people call it the president of China when he's a uh, visiting dignitary, mm -hmm. or, and they compare and contrast the U.S. and China as, as two of the same, uh, two different types of fruit. When, when, one is, when one is a fruit and one is like, you know, a piece of toxic acid, they're, they're completely two different things altogether. There's not exactly politics in the way that we understand politics here. There is a, a regime which is essentially a, created a police state, an open air prison, which all people have to obey and dictate otherwise they could be tortured and killed. So it's, it's a very, very different way of life. So it's not about, we, we can't think of it in the same way like the government has a problem with it. It's not so much that the government has a problem with it, it's that there are individual people with enough power because totalitarianism allows for individual people to have that much power that they can wield the apparatus of the state against the people. And, and well, Arping, you were mentioning earlier about sort of the, the principles of Falun Gong versus the Communist Party's uh, ideology. Yeah. To answer the question from the internet, uh, there is two simple you know, response. One is the membership, membership, you know, because there's a huge number of practitioners in China, over 100 million. You know, all numbers, the membership of the Communist Party that cause fear of the regime. That's why they're persecuted. The second reason will be, simply put, is uh, the spiritual principles of truthfulness, compassion, tolerance go against the communist ideology because what truthfulness, compassion, tolerance represent is traditional values. And they are actually universal values, not just in China. That's why it is embraced worldwide. But if everyone speaks the truth, if everyone's being compassionate and being tolerant, imagine how could a communist dictatorship society exist? Well, what we've seen a lot of people be uh, you know, compassionate in this parade, and we're, we're just wrapping up uh, the end of this parade, which is uh, the 2017 Falun Dafa Day live celebration in New York. Uh, the principles of the practice, as you mentioned, is we're seeing truthfulness, compassion, tolerance. Uh, and this last part of the parade uh, is the waste drum team. That's the right. The waste drum team 
And uh, essentially, the name describes it all. It is a team of very organized Falun Gong practitioners who are sort of having these very beautiful movements, and they're playing the waist drum. And as you can see in the group, there are people of all ages. It's not just younger ladies. There are also uh, more elderly ladies in the group. And it- They uh, seem to be in pretty good shape, They are though. in good shape, and they <laughs> demonstrate what we've been talking about, is that how Falun Gong brings good health and, to people. And Falun Gong, sort of at its core, is a, is a traditional Chinese meditation and exercise practice. Uh, with those principles that you mentioned earlier. Um, so this pretty much wraps it up for today's live broadcast. And I want to thank our guests, uh, Arping Zhang, uh, Falun Dafa Information Center spokesperson. Mm -hmm. Arping, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you. Uh, and Zenin Dolnicki, veteran Falun Gong practitioner. Zenin, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And thank all of you for uh, watching us on Facebook, on YouTube, and on our website, ntd.tv. Signing out, I'm Matt Ganezda. And I'm Yi Yang. Thanks for watching.